started, we are at 8.30. Thank you everyone for being here and welcome to the Value-Based Care Virtual Summit. I am Amy Etzel, Implementation Manager with the Brie Collaborative. On behalf of the Brie Collaborative and the Washington Health Alliance, we are so excited you could be here with us this morning and thankful for your commitment to supporting a more rapid acceleration of value-based payment models across our state. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping items of note. We have an exciting lineup of speakers and anticipate smooth transitions between everyone. And we also thank you in advance for your patience and understanding and grace of any technical issues we may experience. You are all currently on mute and we will and will be throughout the day. During each presentation, please feel free to write a question into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please enter questions for our speakers in the Q&A box and any technical issues into the chat box. We will be monitoring both throughout the day. Okay, so let's dive into our day. Before I hand it over to Jenny Weir, Director of the Brie Collaborative and Interim CEO of the Foundation for Healthcare Quality, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that we are all gathered throughout Washington on the ancestral traditional land and water of 29 tribal nations and three tribes working toward recognition by the US federal government. We honor with gratitude the land itself and these tribes. Okay, over to you, Jenny. Thanks, Amy. And I'm really grateful for today's opportunity to share space and optimistic thinking with our speakers and with all of you participating online and on the phone. 2020 has been exhausting and has reiterated again and again how our healthcare system fails to meet the needs of the people it serves, but also the exceptional dedication of the clinicians and all of those working to deliver care and to really improve this framework. And this work, again, is a joint effort between the Brie Collaborative at the Foundation for Healthcare Quality and the Washington Health Alliance, generously supported by Cambia Grove. So looking at our word cloud, I see positive and negative here. I see siloed, fragmented, and even, but I do see creative. I see opportunities. I see challenges. And I think that those pros and cons really will weave themselves throughout our conversation today. So it is my pleasure to turn this over to Dr. Hugh Straley, Chair of our Brie Collaborative and Retired Medical Director of Group Health Cooperative, now Kaiser Permanente, Retired President of Group Health Physicians, and my fellow pandemic puppy owner. <laughs> Hugh, the stage is yours. Thank you, Jenny, and uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, we have, uh, I think, almost 500 uh, people uh, signed up, and so it's a, a pleasure to welcome you all to this uh, value-based summit. And I want to thank the team uh, from the Washington Health Alliance, the Foundation for Healthcare Quality, and the Brie Collaborative who have uh, put this uh, morning together. Uh, today we're calling to action all the stakeholders to make needed improvements in the way we provide and pay for care. After the tumultuous election of last week, we do expect a change in federal government. We also know that under any administration, there is a need for dramatic improvement in the way we finance and provide care for everyone. Because we're now living with a new normal, the pandemic with its isolation and a scourge of many lives with death, illness, and loss, we have seen up close how our healthcare system's vulnerabilities have been exposed and the terrible social inequities laid bare. We know now more than ever how change is needed in our society and in our healthcare system to prepare us for the challenges of the future. Today, we're fortunate to have uh, many group, uh, le many uh, leaders and experts to discuss how we can make these needed changes here in Washington. But to start us off, it is my honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Don Berwick, President Emeritus and Senior Fellow for the Institute for Healthcare Improvement and former Administrator for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Many, is, many of us have been fortunate to know Don as he has been a frequent visitor to Washington over many years, as we sought his advice and counsel in our pursuit of quality of care giving, and he has given generously of his time to uh, Group Health, Virginia Mason, Kaiser Permanente, and many other institutions here in uh, Washington. Over the years, Don has become one of the most influential voices for change and improvement in healthcare, both in the United States and internationally. I will not cite all of his many accomplishments and awards. I will just introduce Dr. Berwick as a physician who puts patients first, a systems engineer and scientist who works to fix broken systems, 
an influential leader who leads with humility, always focusing on teams, and a wise thinker whose speeches and writings call for the moral necessity for change that will provide quality health care for all. It is my pleasure to introduce you, uh, introduce Dr. Don Berwick. Our new awareness of issues and equity. All of that is about AIM. And then along comes COVID, uh, tossing us all sorts of new choices about the way you want to be as a health system for you and your region and, and, and me and mine. This is a paper I wrote about choices in the new normal in uh, JAMA just a couple of months ago. And in that paper, I said, well, here's what COVID's pitching us. This is, these are some choices we get to make, which are relevant to, the, to this meeting and to all of your efforts in the, in the um, Seattle and uh, Washington area. Um, speed, uh, I, I actually got an email from a group of intensive care doctors in Seattle shortly after the, uh, the virus hit Seattle. Uh, in, what had happened was a group of, of um, intensive care doctors in Seattle had reached out to intensive care doctors in Wuhan, China, and had debriefed them in about a three or four page single spaced email about all the lessons that had been learned in the Wuhan that needed to be learned and used in Seattle. That did not reach me from Seattle. It came through a colleague in Boston. Literally within minutes of the creation of that um, informal document, it was all over the United States. My daughter, a hospitalist in a Boston hospital, had it on her desk. Uh, JAMA is turning around papers in hours that would have taken weeks. The National Academy of Medicine is setting up, uh, has set up a standing committee that I serve on that produces reports. Eleven reports in one month, whereas you know that National Academy usually takes 18 months into a single report. I actually have an emergency meeting of that standard of that committee on Sunday this week because a new question has arisen and they're going to issue a report instantly. Standardization to uh, the best known practices. We, we vary widely. That's something the Brie Collaborative has worked on. And now we seem avid for learning about standards in COVID care. Will we generalize that? Uh, virtual care, of course, soaring in this country, uh, forcing us to rethink um, assumptions we've had about the needs for visits and, and certain patterns of resource consumption that appear actually unnecessary. We'll learn a lot from COVID about what care we thought was needed, but actually isn't. Protecting the workforce, which is a major and dramatic and tragic issue right now, but we've, we've got caught on our heels and we need to learn to do this better with an expanded view of the workforce, of course, and then preparedness itself, where we uh, we, we just were a country that's embarrassingly unprepared, despite the ratings we had before the pandemic, and hopefully we'll now have a plan to get out of that. And then inequity, which is the topic of the remainder of my remarks here, because everything that we've learned in COVID is just reteaching us what we already knew about disparities and inequity in healthcare in our, in our, in our country. Uh, these are choices, choices for, for Washington State, choices for you all participating today, choices for the emphasis of the Brie Collaborative and, and, and more. Uh, will we go slow or fast in the future? Will we adopt standards and embrace evidence-based care? Will we, what, what are we gonna do with the virtual world of care? And how can we assure that it's everything it should be? Will we protect the workforce? Will we be prepared for the next threat? And what about inequity? Inequity, by the way, is a theme in the workforce, of course. Uh, this, um, Paper uh, in May uh, asserts that more than 800,000 healthcare workers and 1.1 million of their kids live in poverty across the United States. They get paid in healthcare, but they get paid so little that they're below the U.S. poverty line. So eight, uh, of the 18 and a half million people in our industry, 10% of them get paid so little that they have to be on Medicaid. 1.4 million healthcare workers have no health insurance at all. And you can see, you can read also about the exposures that our workforce is getting, especially lower paid uh, people in communities of color. Justice and equity isn't just out there, it's in here in the healthcare world and not a bad focus for, the, for your work. Now, the rest of what I'm gonna focus on pivots off the work of Sir Michael Marmot. I spoke about him in the Institute of Medicine speeches. You may have seen this before. I apologize if I'm repeating myself. Michael is a world-class epidemiologist who in 2015 published this book, which I personally believe should be required reading for everyone in healthcare. Uh, it's called The Health Gap. And what Marmot did was take evidence on social determinants of health, the, the things that actually make us sick, and, and uh, sort them. He, he, he analyzed the thousands of papers and decades of research into a, into a 
comprehensive picture of what we should mean when we say social determinants of health. The, the basic point here, of course, is that health care doesn't create health. If you want a healthy Washington state, a healthy Northwest region of the country, working on health care isn't, isn't even close to enough. I'm going to show you more about that. What Marmot lays out is what the science says about the nature of social determinants. And these are the five big categories that he speaks about. Early childhood experiences, stresses in childhood, adverse childhood experiences. These are enormously powerful determinants of well-being in adulthood. For example, children with more than four adverse childhood experiences, uh, which were first defined by Kaiser Permanente and the CDC, more than four ACEs leads to double or triple the rates of cancer, heart disease, lung disease, and other adult diseases in adults. Um, early childhood experiences determine uh, a lot about adult mental health, substance abuse levels, suicide rates. Uh, they're extremely powerful determinants. Healthy countries, healthy societies, healthy regions invest heavily in the well-being of children in the early years. The education system, its fairness, its comprehensiveness, its quality, that also correlates very strongly with well-being in adulthood and longevity in societies. So do conditions in the work of work and in the workplace. Importantly, the, the uh, assured level of wages, a minimum wage is not enough to achieve health in a society. We need a, a wage compatible with full life. Countries that commit to that ha live longer. Uh, and then workplace conditions like meaning in work and toxic exposures and safety in the workplace. The fourth uh, correlate of longevity in thriving society is how societies care for their elders. Societies that invest in strong infrastructures for older people, especially to avoid loneliness and keep their lives meaningful in, in context of commerce and society. Those societies live longer. It, expects, it affects everyone, not just elders. And then fifth is what Marmot calls community resilience. This is a whole list of things uh, which you could guess. These are aspects of communities that make them, uh, the, uh, give them a sense of agency and uh, support for everyone. Food security, transportation security, housing security, violence prevention, the criminal justice system, recreational opportunities, and more. And you'll see more about that in a minute. To these five uh, causes of health, uh, Michael Marmot adds a sixth that he calls the cause of the causes, which is a sense of fairness, a sense of equity. Marmot's uh, call to arms in his book is this, inequities in power, money, and resources give rise to the inequities in the conditions of daily life, which in turn lead to inequities in health. So he calls fairness solidarity, compassion, equity, the cause of the causes. Uh, this is an edgy assertion. It's a scientific insertion. Uh, Michael is politically active, but this is not a political statement. This is about the choices societies make in determining whether they're healthy or not. Societies that redistribute power, money, and resources to people of disadvantage to assure great childhood experiences, sound education, uh, productive and supportive workplaces, elder care and community resilience. Those societies that commit to that level of equity live longer, far longer, far, far longer. I'll show you uh, uh, an American condition, which I, I strongly recommend that you dig into in the Washington state area if you value this. So we're going back. So the first of Marmot's determinants is early childhood. So let's look at the conditions of early childhood. Uh, this is a paper that appeared uh, this month, actually, in Health Affairs. It's by a group, a national group that works on uh, something called the, chi the Child Opportunity Index. It's, a, it's an area by area index of the conditions in which children are being raised. It is a, it's, a, it's a specific representation of what Marmot calls early childhood experiences. Uh, this is the contact information for that, the diversitydatakids.org, and the, the you can find this paper, and the first author you will see is Dolores Acevedo-Garcia from Brandeis. Uh, so, so this is what opportunity looks like in, uh, in the U.S. The, the index, area by area, and I think there are seven, I want to say 17,000 areas profiled. Uh, are profiled according to scores on this very long list of these are conditions of living for kids that affect kids. So it's a oper operationalization of what early childhood experience means in the marmot categorical scheme. Uh, here's a hypothetical two neighborhoods, neighborhood A, neighborhood B. 
so in, in this case, so some indicators, poverty rate, enrollment in early childhood opportunities, lack of green space, limited proximity to healthy food, housing vacancy. This is an afflicted neighborhood with lower opportunity. Here is a much a one where opportunities are much higher. This would be a high scoring opportunity neighborhood. This would be a low scoring opportunity neighborhood. Now, the uh, distribution of opportunity, the conditions of early childhood, to use Marmot's term, is highly racialized. In the United States, if you take all areas, all of those, I think it's 17,000 areas, and rank them from very low opportunity to very high opportunity, here's the distribution of areas for white and Asian and Pacific Islander children and neighborhoods. This is the distribution from very low to very high for Hispanic and Black. A racial a uh, correlate of opportunity that is profound. This is, you might've think of this sort of as the modern um, picture of redlining. As redlining distorted access to housing according to racial lines in cities all over this country. So today, today does child opportunity see uh, wide disparities in uh, levels uh, depending on, on race. I should have, but I don't have the Washington State profile here. You could get it from the authors of this paper and see how child opportunity is distributed. Your neighbor, by the way, British Columbia, has an, an enormous project called um, the HELP Project, Healthy Early um, Learning Project, which has done that. It's got neighborhood and, in fact, child-level data about the distribution of the well-being of children throughout BC. and You could learn from them. Let me show you how this looks, for example, in our nation's capital area. This is the Baltimore, Columbia, Towson, Maryland area. Uh, what you see here is a color-coded picture of child opportunity. So dark areas are high opportunity, light areas are low opportunity. Every dot here in this green, of these green dots, every dot is 20 white children, age zero to 17. And this is where they live, sorted among these opportunity areas. Here's the profile for black children, 20 children per dot. This again, this sort of racial uh, uh, segregation of opportunities for children mapped back scientifically to Marmot's assertion about early childhood experience as a determinant of well-being in adulthood allows us to predict what disparities are gonna occur in health and well-being in that area. It plays out of course in the American context in every metric of wealth and health and well-being we have. This is the metric of infant mortality in the U.S. where Blacks more than double whites. American, Native Americans are equally afflicted in some conditions more afflicted, and I certainly always have Native Americans and Latinos in mind when we're talking about disparities. There is an income side to this. I don't want to again say that, that being, being low income is also a risk factor independent of race. Um, in fact, here is the the distribution of relative risk of mortality by household, all-cause mortality by income level in the U.S., uh, and with a threefold increase at very low in levels of income compared to more reasonable levels of income. Uh, this is uh, somewhat old data, but the, the profile has remained the same. If you adjust, by the way, for um, for uh, income, uh, you still there's still a racial difference in well-being. So that at any level of income. It is considerably worse in terms of one's health status and um, physical, physical and mental condition uh, to be a racial minority. This shows the cases for COVID deaths. Uh, Black, Bangladeshi, or South Asian and Indian in the U.S. with these bars being the unadjusted, unadjusted for urbanicity and age and um, intercurrent medical conditions and um, uh, household composition. Uh, four to one ratios of deaths for male and female blacks, 3.6 and 3.4 for South Asians. Um, when one adjusts for everything, you get you do get rid of some of that difference, but still double the rates of death uh, for uh, African Americans and other uh, people of color. Uh, this plays out in the famous subway maps. This is the map of the London Tube. Here you see Oxford Circus. Each subway stop is indexed here for life expectancy, 96 years, believe it or not, in the Oxford Circus area, a very wealthy area of, of uh, London. Here's Hyde Park and Piccadilly Circus, 90 years. 
Over here is East London, a much more impoverished area, much social disadvantage. In Star Lane, at that subway stop, the life expectancy is twenty is uh, seventy five years, twenty one year lower life expectancy in about a six mile ride on the London Tube, losing about two years of two and a half years of life per mile ridden. Uh, this is the same picture in New York City. There's Midtown Manhattan with average income about 180, median income about $180,000, largely uh, white in, in color. Uh, here's the South Bronx, Black, Latino, and other minorities. Um, average income less than a third of what it was in Midtown Manhattan. Life expectancy difference is 10 years on that subway ride, two and a half, 2.3 years per mile of life lost as you go from Midtown to Manhattan to the uh, South Bronx. That's massive, by the way, six months for every minute on the subway, 3.2 years for every mile traveled. It's not, a, it's not a ramp, actually. It's a cliff, but that's the difference if you go that distance. This is a paper I found in the British Medical Journal a couple of years ago, which was a meta-analysis of the effect of the medical miracle statins on survival. The statin literature is actually very controversial, but these authors estimated the most favorable estimate of the effect of primary prevention trials on statins. And uh, the, their bottom line is for every, um, for every year on statin, you gain about one day of life in primary prevention. That's the, that's the most optimistic estimate at a population level. Uh, if you take statins for 20 years, you gain 20 days of life. Using the subway map, that's 20 days of life are lost on the D train in Manhattan in seven seconds going from Midtown Manhattan to the South Bronx. You lose 20 days of life and 43 feet riding the bus across Glasgow. These social determinants that Marbet talks about are massive. They are massive compared to anything we can do in healthcare. You want a healthy Northwest? You want a healthy Washington? Working on healthcare is a very weak lead. Uh, the effects on life expectancy of these disparities is enormous. Uh, this is a chart showing life expectancy for men at age 50, according to year of birth, uh, men born in 1920 here, men born in 1950. So these men are now 70 years old. Uh, the, the poorest 10% of men in the United States have gained virtually no life expectancy over that 30 year period. Uh, the same for the next 20%, whereas the richest uh, tranche of life of uh, Americans has gained life expectancy quite fast. For women, it's worse. For women in the bottom third of the population, life expectancy has fallen depending on year of birth during this 30 year period, while it's grown substantially for the richest. We are a highly inequitable society and the inequities play out uh, in life expectancy and well-being dramatically. And the point is the effects are far greater than any effect healthcare can hope for. Layered on all this, or underneath it all maybe, is racism, 400-year uh, history of slavery, uh, deep, deep disadvantage for racial minorities, especially African Americans, but not only African Americans, uh, Latinos, uh, Native Americans, and others, as you well know, uh, pay a price for uh, structural division in our society, something that we have become more vividly reminded again of in the wake of George Floyd's murder, but but by no means, by no means uh, new. Uh, so here's my, here's where this leads me to a really, really uncomfortable place, a challenge to all of us in this country and to our health system in particular it's a kind of begins with a question why, a question you might want to ask in this conference and in the work of the, collab the amazing collaborative you've established. I've never seen more collaborative work than in your part of the country. The Washington State Hospital Association has been brilliant in pulling together hospitals to do wonderful, wonderful work. The Washington Health Alliance, same. Um, but we really have to take stock. And taking stock tells me that we have admired these problems for decades, known about them, for decades, measured them for decades, and not, not done anything about them. I, I, I know that's a bit of an overstatement, but not, not much. Look at those life expectancy curves. We live with forms of unfairness, to use Marmot's term, in the United States that kill people early, that deny them live fears, that, that steal away well-being and vitality. We've admired these problems and not solved them. Is it because they're out of reach? No, not at all. 
other countries have solved them much better than we have. And we have cases throughout our country of little pockets of success. But we have not done what we need to do. We can't seem to find the will in economics. The economic consequences of these disparities is phenomenal. Not enough to motivate us, apparently. We can't seem to find it in politics and public policy. We fight about them, and we're arguing still about basic issues in well-being. Uh, politically, we can't even use the word redistribution. You won't get elected if you use that word. And yet, how can we help the poor if we don't transfer resources? Uh, I, I've come to think in my aging life that we better check our moral compass. I, I know no other source of energy. I can't tell you what in the Pacific Northwest or the state of Washington will motivate the level of change needed. I will simply tell you in all honesty from all the evidence, the change isn't there. I've recommended a campaign based on the moral determinants. What if we followed our moral compass would we work on? We'd work on those social determinants. Here's seven things we would book we would join the human rights movement of the world. We, the United States has not ratified basic human rights treaties of the UN conventions, the Convention on Ch Rights of Children, Convention of Rights of Women, the Convention on Rights of Migrants and Their Families. We have, we have left aside and walked away from the table in, in major human rights treaties over decades. Second, we have not made healthcare a human right in our nation. You have not made healthcare a human right in Washington. Time to do it. Uh, we, we are trapped in these arguments about methodologies and which law you support and what you believe, but the, the commitment has not been there. 30 million people left out in our country today, uh, another 50 million with inadequate insurance. Restoring American leadership to reversal of climate change. I'm delighted that the president elect Biden has decided to rejoin the Paris Accord, but that's only the beginning. The National Academy of Medicine at its annual meeting last year, last week, declared that one of its three top priorities, along with equity and COVID, will be reversing healthcare's impact on climate change and dealing with the climate change impact on health. We need to join that and lead it. The fourth is the criminal justice system. It's a travesty in this country. 2.3 million people in our prisons and jails, uh, seven to one African-American, five to one Latino. We use, it's the new Jim Crow, as Michelle Alexander's book says, and the criminal justice system in America is an embarrassment to our country. We incarcerate people much more frequently, nearly twice the rate of the next most <laughs> uh, avid country for incarceration. We build prisons, but not justice. And we, uh, we know what to do. There are programs of diversion, of uh, compassionate care in prisons, and uh, healing processes in prisons and jails, and most important, reentry of people leaving criminal justice. We could fix it. We have not fixed it, to say the least. I am sick and tired of the policies of exclusion and abuse at our southern border. Uh, we, we run away from compassionate reform of immigration policies. It's time to stop that. Hunger and homelessness abound in our nation. There are 40 million hungry people in America, 17 million hungry children now in this COVID pandemic, 600,000 chronically homeless in America. In the state of Washington, there need not be a single hungry person. There need not be a single homeless person. We would know how to stop it and we have not stopped it. Uh, and then there's the underpinnings and the nature of democratic institutions themselves. Our agencies and policies need to be science-based, as you know. Uh, we need fact-based work on, on everything that has to do with well-being and equity. And that, to me, echoes also in the, in, in, in the counting of votes. Uh, a rural voter in America in the Electoral College has 70 times the weight of an urban voter, and we need to reconsider the nature of democracy itself, the foundations of solidarity. I guess I'm raising a question. I don't mean to be rude, but I do mean to be assertive. Can we do something? Can the Bree Collaborative and the Washington State Health Alliance and all the actors in your amazing, wonderful state set and achieve aims with respect to the social and moral determinants of health? Could you do this campaign? If not, we will get Great health care. I, I don't doubt that. You're already there. It can be made better and you're making it better. You won't get health. It won't happen. You're working on the wrong thing. And so that's the challenge, Jenny, and, and uh, colleagues that I uh, put forward to you all and uh, with, as a friend, as a friend and a fan and a willing, a willing helper any day you ask me. Thanks a lot, Jenny. 
Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us in this virtual space and for challenging us uh, as we move forward and, and through this pandemic. So I, uh, it's really an honor that you were able to join. And I think we're lucky in, in many ways in Washington state. Um, and you talked a little bit of, about that, our collaborative nature. I always like to compare us to other regions and other states across the country. I think that's really interesting. We did just have a, a one question I, I want to touch on about the quadruple aim and um, really supporting clinicians and clinical teams. And I feel that the value-based payment space is, is, is more supportive. Um, I'm wondering if you could just touch on that before we move on. Well, as, as an aim, uh, we, we need to deal with it at home. You saw the statistics about salary levels and conditions, you saw the PPE problem, and we and you saw that we now need to rethink what the workforce is. So, absolutely, quadruple aim or not, I mean, I I quibble about it. I think the idea of the triple aim was to identify the needs of society out there, and to deal with that, we definitely have to have a robust, joyous, supported workforce. So, no doubt about that. In terms of payment models, I'm um, I'm less uh, convinced about value-based payment as it's currently playing out. It doesn't go far enough. In order to have healthy societies and a healthy force, we need to be able to distribute resources far more broadly than we currently do today. We have to end hunger. We have to end homelessness. We have to fix those salary disparities. Value-based payment will encourage us to focus on whatever is measured in value, but it isn't the transformative. It doesn't get us to the transformative view of uh, societal investment, solidarity, compassion, justice that I think I'm calling for in this talk. So is it a step forward? It is. But we won't be uh, equitable and fair to, our, to the healthcare workforce or to society at large until we are willing to take resources in places that we currently don't put them. Very true. Well, thank you. And I appreciate the challenge. That is always a good place to, to start the conversation. So I, uh, thank you. Um, it's my, I'm going to have to leave and I, I wish you well. Uh, thank you for letting me join your conference. Many thanks to do. Thank you, Don. Bye-bye. And I think we're really lucky to have a healthcare community that's willing to be both self-reflective and aspirational. And this can really be seen in the partnership between our Brie Collaborative, the Foundation for Healthcare Quality, the Alliance, and our sponsorship here today by Cambia Grove. And I also really want to emphasize that dedication of clinicians, clinical teams, administrators, as we, as we move through the pandemic surges and stresses. We're also really lucky to have leadership at the state level that is forward thinking and collaborative. And it's really my pleasure to introduce Sue Birch, director of the Washington State Healthcare Authority. She is a nurse by training and has spent nearly seven years as the executive director of the Colorado Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing, where she led the state's successful implementation of the Affordable Care Act. And Sue is joined by Dr. Judy Zerzan Thule, chief medical officer of the Healthcare Authority. Judy is a general internal medicine physician who previously served as chief medical officer for the Colorado Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing. Sue and Judy, the stage is yours. And you are muted. Danny, are we unmuted? You're good. You are. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Flipping between different systems and meetings, state, national, just interesting times, so I apologize. Hi, everybody. I'm Sue Birch. I'm the director for the Washington State Healthcare Authority, a major partner with all of you and with the Alliance. Um, Don's um, words were completely music to my ears. Um, what I would like to do is just set the stage a little bit more about the VBP environment, but we here in Washington totally agree. You don't just do all this through um, payment, payment reforms. That is just one necessary lever. So I'd like to talk a little bit more about the other pieces that are very important and um, in our uh, vision and strategy going forward. Um, and I think, Jenny, you're driving the slide. So I'll just um, go have you go to the next slide. So, um, I think everybody knows that we 
are a behemoth. We're the largest purchaser, purchaser of healthcare in the state with an annual healthcare spend um, between 12 and 14 billion. And we purchase healthcare for one in three non-Medicare Washingtonians. Uh, currently we're about 1.8, 1.9 million lives in Medicaid. Pretty steady growth, about um, 12, 1,400 on average per week where we see increases. Um, 380,000 are in our PEB or Public Employee Benefits Program. Another 250 lives in our school employee benefits, which began in 2020. And it's really important um, as we are putting that purchasing power together for those populations, uh, we want to assure that we reward patient-centeredness, high quality care. We want to reward health plan and system performance, drive standardization, and really we have got to keep pushing out the over-medicalization and get in the appropriate evidence-based social um, pieces that uh, Don referred to and that we all know. So we are all about changing the incentive structure and the value-based payment changes in that structure. And we, but really importantly to note is we've got to ensure that providers are accountable for that high quality care, the patient experience, and we've got to really understand the cost because quite frankly, there's so much administrative over-engineering, so much burden. Um, there's also quite frankly, quite a bit of profiteering in the system that we want to really look at how we examine um, kind of total cost to care landscape. Um, now, we are pay setters in the country um, about healthcare payment and learning and the action network and all the different um, committees that we sit on. And I think many of you know, you've seen this um, diagram, the LAN fr framework, the APM models framework. And um, we uh, have been uh, part of this journey since before the Affordable Care Act and certainly have accelerated, um, not just with Washington, but a lot of our uh, professional involvement. And um, it's great that we participate in a multi-stakeholder group nationally, um, sponsored with CMS. We have lots of conversations with CMS and we use this framework in our contracts. We use this for um, payment um, in our value surveys. We use this for the performance metrics and um, our DISRIP incentives. And it's not to do too much acronym speak, but that is the Delivery Service Reform Incentives Program. And we have a body of work that's coming around MQIP or um, our Medical Quality Improvement, um, I'm sorry, Medicaid Quality Improvement Program that we are uh, uh, weaving into all of our transformation work under our very large uh, 1115 waiver. So next slide. Um, if you look at the roadmap, and I, I know I am um, preaching to the choir here, but really our vision is to achieve a healthier Washington by aligning um, those programs according to kind of a one HCA purchasing philosophy. We want to hold plan partners in the delivery system networks more accountable for quality and value. We want to exercise significant oversight and quality assurance um, with those contracts and the implementation. And then certainly working with people because we get that we have to course correct or do corrective actions all the time. But you can see our progress and we're pretty pleased and we've been cited by CMS and others for really being well on this VVP roadmap. But I can't stress enough the importance of striving for lower costs, um, getting better outcomes, getting uh, better consumer involvement and provider um, experience and involvement in all of this changing landscape. Um, let's go on to the next slide. All right, so our uh, roadmap by 2022, and this has just been published in October, um, and it outlines our vision for the transformation through 2025, but we really need to keep shifting from paying for that volume to paying for the health and value outcomes that we want. And quite frankly, if we could just get all of the unevenness out of the systems that we are all responsible for, we'd make extraordinary successes. Uh, things like higher quality services, um, enhancing those, 
getting the costs um, more in line, getting uh, greater health equity, which if anything um, is more important now than ever. We know that improving access um, is gonna still be paramount as we continue forward during these really challenging pandemic times. And then with the patients and providers, we have to keep uh, incenting patients to be more engaged and involved and create systems that are more centered for our patients and for providers, we also need to be looking at how we are going to help retool them and help them really enter the multi, um, uh, the interdisciplinary team environments that will deliver on better successes. Let's go on to the next slide. So our arrangements um, will be aligned uh, across all our public purchasing programs and we're going to advance multi-payer primary care models where appropriate. Um, we have taken a step backwards in Washington to really begin a journey and thank you to all of you that have invested in our primary care movement. We know quite simply that we can do so much better with enhanced primary care environments and continue to shift upstream and get in again those evidence-based social um, and behavioral health integration needs that will help contain costs. Um, the VBP arrangements are going to be rooted in data-driven policymaking. We've, as in collaboration with the BRI and HTCC and all of our efforts around the APCD and data, we know that we have to keep using um, better tools and techniques about collecting and uh, utilizing the data that is out there. And we have to keep creating um, advances. And I, I think we've seen significant movement as well on really using more intelligent data and leveraging systems forward. Um, this is just a, <laughs> this is just a simple box depicting these very complex topics, but these are the things that are very key uh, priority issues for healthcare authority. And I can speak for um, the other health and human service cabinet secretaries. We are working at, on many of these issues cross-sectorally, health equity and social determinant, critically important. Um, I spoke already about that primary care, um, the alignment with uh, um, behavioral health and integrated care, the accountability and support, data, 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 um, and access and affordability. Ultimately, we have got to just really look at how we are going to bring costs down and get the bloat out of the system and get products that are more, more affordable and more usable. Judy, I think I am going to turn it over to you because my phone is going crazy about something. And it's great to be with you all for as long as we can be. Um, very interesting times we're in right now. But thank you for your partnership. And thank you so much for being on point and engaged in this VBP work as well as all the COVID response. Be well. Judy, yours. Thanks, Sue. So as Sue mentioned, we have these seven priority areas in our new VBP roadmap. And to go along with that, uh, we have eight foundational principles in this roadmap. It's all on our website. But um, I think these really sort of emphasize the importance of these various principles and advancing VBP to HCA. So first, to continually strive for smarter spending, better outcomes, better consumer and provider experience. That's the triple quadruple aim and to hold our programs and partners accountable for those goals. Second is to reward the delivery of person and family centered care um, that is high value, affordable and accessible. Third is really thinking about uh, that integrated care and supporting the delivery of whole person care that is really centered on primary care um, and uh, sort of grounded in paying for it with a prospective payment uh, in terms of an alternative payment model. This allows, I think, both clinicians and uh, members to get a coordinated set of services that really focuses on physical health, behavioral health, and social needs. And then four, and as Sue mentioned, this is a new topic to our work that we're really putting an emphasis on. In fact, I'll put a plug in here that we're hiring a health equity manager if you or anyone is interested. Um, but to approach all of this VBP work with a health equity lens to um, continue to improve uh, health for all Washington residents. Uh, next slide. 
five is to leverage our purchasing power uh, to drive improved performance of the healthcare system, uh, which is something we've been doing for a while now. Um, but I think particularly with the addition of SEB, it gives us a little more, um, a little more weight. Sixth is aligning our payment and delivery reform approaches with other purchasers and payers. I'll talk a little bit about how we're doing that in primary care, but I think that alignment across payers, and I saw a, a question come up in the chat box that, that it is critically important for all payers to align and pull in this together. Seventh is engage in data-driven policymaking to advance standardization and care transformation. Uh, we are continuing to work on this um, and evolve the data and evolve the transparency of the data. And then finally, increase the long-term financial sustainability of state health programs. Next. I want to take a moment and celebrate some of our VBP successes uh, because we have been at this for a while together with you and I think have made some great strides. Um, the, the first column here is new models, and I'll say new-ish because some of them have been in progress for a bit, but um, we have a new VVP program for hepatitis C treatment uh, that crosses all state programs, uh, including Medicaid, uh, and is a partnership with AbbVie that we have gotten really much better pricing than was available to us before, and really a partner to go out and find people for hepatitis C testing and get them treated. Second is Cascade Care, which has uh, recently been procured and is launching of how do we get um, better benefits uh, at a more affordable price out to Washingtonians. And then third is a substance use uh, APM planning grant where we're starting to look at different ways we can pay for value in uh, for substance use providers. I'm going to talk a little bit more shortly about our Centers of Excellence program that we launched a few years ago and is quite successful. Uh, we also have an accountable care program that is offered through PEB and SEB. This is one area where we've seen continued uptake uh, in these plans over time, which is quite promising that I think uh, people are seeing the value of these plans and how it can help them stay healthy. We have uh, various milestones in terms of uh, our accountable care plans that I just mentioned in our MCO VBP work has been approved as a advanced alternative payment methodology by CMS. Um, this is good news for providers and for us uh, that uh, shows we are advancing care. There's also um, our continued work in our 1115 Medicaid transformation wet, uh, measure. In terms of measuring things, uh, our managed care withhold has been increased by the legislature uh, coming on, I guess, almost two years ago now um, to really think about how do we improve quality and how do we incentivize that improvement of quality. Uh, common quality measures across uh, our contracts and then these surveys and hopefully our new survey will be out soon. So keep posted for that next. I wanted to talk a little bit more about our Centers of Excellence program. Uh, this isn't available across all of our plans, um, but is um, in sort of the greatest bulk of our plans. And these, uh, these bundles are based on brief collaborative standards that include uh, the site and care team, um, outline indications for surgery and fitness for surgery uh, by the patient, um, and include a payment model and a warranty. And so we at HCA contract for the episode of care with the center of excellence bearing the financial risk and the quality metrics. And one of the really nifty things is that cost share is waived for participating members. So um, people are able to get uh, these joint replacements um, with no out-of-pocket costs, which I think is really important. And we've had some really great outcomes from them, I think, in terms of better care. So joint replacement was our first bundle. It includes hip and knee, and it started in 2017. And Virginia Mason is our partner for that. And then spine care, uh, we started in 2019. Um, for uh, Virginia Mason and Capital Medical Center are two, uh, are two for that. And one of the interesting things I think about spine care is that it not only includes the actual surgery if there's a spine care fusion, but there's also a non-surgical evaluation pathway. 
So um, if it's not clear whether surgery is right, um, we will still pay for that evaluation and discussion about options uh, with the patient. Next slide. So to date, uh, we've paid for uh, almost 270 surgeries and the total joint replacement. Two thirds of them are knee and a third of them are hip. Um, and we've had participation from almost every county, which is quite exciting. For spine care, um, this was launched in 2019 and uh, we thought there would be an increased buildup in volume, but as with many things, COVID has impacted this. Um, but uh, we have saved money and we really have very high quality results. The, the post-operative infections, um, some of the problems have been almost eliminated and it's really quite impressive, the results of this. There's also very high patient satisfaction, much higher than in other areas, and it's a program we're quite proud of. Next. So I wanted to touch here that uh, COVID has really impacted our work on this as it has with everything. Um, and I think has really emphasized the need for us to move to value-based payment arrangements, that we really need to get away from the fee-for-service uh, foundation that our healthcare system is built on and look at different ways of delivering care and look at different ways of paying for them. And so we have been uh, expanded uh, our telehealth and virtual care. Uh, we've been working on this primary care project I'll talk about in a minute. and. Uh, have looked at adjusting some of our VBP targets uh, in our contracts. Next slide. So one of the things uh, that I uh, want to talk about is this uh, sort of what we're looking at when we develop these new models of care. And data is really at the center of any new model when we're thinking about it and how do we look at both um, sort of the more administrative kinds of data, but also more qualitative bits of data or data that can be captured out of the electronic medical record and what does that look like? And so um, in all of our new models of care, we have risk sharing at the provider level that rewards for uh, good performance. We use quality measures from the Washington statewide common measure set so that there is some alignment in quality. Uh, we have a quality improvement model that uh, encourages practices to improve upon where they are starting from. Um, and then if they have excellent performance and maintain that, they get rewarded for that. And then care transformation strategies based on the BRE collaborative recommendations, which has been uh, a great partner for all of this. Next. This is a bit of a busy slide, but um, wanna sort of show you how we're thinking about it in terms of different roles, the state, the MCOs, uh, and our uh, employee and retiree benefit plans, the ACHs and clinicians. And across that, each of them, the, the green boxes are a primary role in working on this and the pink is a secondary role. But you can see that, that everybody has a part to play in this. And so um, defining what are the places, what are our definitions of value-based care, what do we want a model to look like, the delivering VBP. Um, so this is um, how do we get to those goals and what does that look like? Measuring in terms of quality metrics and patient experience. And then uh, the last column, reinforcing VBP, what are the levers we have to be mutually reinforcing across um, these different areas? Next slide. So I wanna talk briefly about our primary care effort. Uh, this is something that we started in the spring of 2019 with a multi-payer table of all of the payers in Washington. And we started this table to talk about improving rural health, but very quickly it was clear that one of the things that was needed not only in the rural areas, but also statewide, is additional support for primary care. And uh, we had a series of meetings of, with plans and also with a clinician group of uh, doctors and nurses from across the state, from all kinds of systems, from small independent ones to big systems, uh, to really uh, shape what that should look like. All of this work is built on the considerable work that we've done here in Washington State 
uh, including Medicaid transformation, our ACHs, um, some early patient-centered medical homework, and pediatric work. And the, the goals and the basic components are really twofold. One, to have a payment methodology that is a, a prospective capitated way of paying for sort of the bulk of primary care that supports an integrated whole person uh, model of care and is aligned across payers. And the second part is to create an aligned approach um, for the measurement of how do we know that we're getting to better primary care and what does that look like? Next. So these are the seven pillars that we have and we are working on fleshing them out. I think many of you probably contributed to uh, uh, comments on this model, but that payers will work towards aligned payment and incentives across payers to support the model and will commit to uh, financing primary care uh, with a particular nod to measuring a percent spend. Providers will work to improve provider capacity and access and apply actionable analytics. All of this is in support of primary care uh, is an integrated whole person model of care, includes uh, physical health, behavioral health, preventative services, uh, and an understanding of social determinants of health. And that care coordination uh, is understood sort of throughout the continuum and there are connections the community organizations and the support that is needed for people and their families. And all of that results in aligned measurement and value from the model. And we put triple aim here, but uh, as we've been discussing internally, it's probably quadruple aim. I think the alignment uh, also helps get there because it makes it easier for clinicians uh, to uh, achieve uh, on the metrics if they're all aligned rather than different. Next. So the proposed payment model um, is threefold, which actually one and three relating to each other. So many practices are ready for these new VVP models and being paid in a different way. And for them, they can just advance to the um, performance incentive. But for practices that have been working on it and are still in progress of their journey, there can be an up to three year transformation of care fee that helps uh, practices get there. And then, um, and then when they're ready, or if they're ready at the beginning, that transfers to a performance incentive that is earned based on the quality metrics and the structural metrics. Um, the bulk of payment for primary care is this um, comprehensive primary care payment that's a per member per month um, and allows more flexibility in terms of how care is delivered and how people connect with the doctor. Next slide. So where we are now in this model is that we've uh, completed public comment. Uh, we had 129 people and organizations respond and 87% uh, were in support of this model. We had a payer memorandum of understanding uh, signing celebration in mid-October uh, where all of our uh, Medicaid and employee and retiree benefit plans uh, signed on. Uh, to continue to work on uh, evolving and implementing this model and supporting primary care. Uh, we're gonna have additional meetings over the coming months uh, and uh, hopefully we'll plan to implement in 2022. Next. I also wanted to briefly say, and I know that we're uh, running short on time, but uh, we haven't lost sight of the rural needs in Washington state. And uh, CMMI has recently re released a, a chart model, community health access and transformation uh, to bring VBP to rural areas with the goals of improving access to care, improving the quality of care, improving health outcomes, and increasing the adoption of alternative payment models. And so we are looking at this opportunity and also uh, taking into account some of the conversations we've had with rural providers over the last few years to figure out what's the best fit for Washington and how can we continue to help spread VBP across the state. Next slide. Um, so the chart model opportunities, um, one of the main pieces that uh, is interesting to apply for this model is that it'll bring Medicare into the fold and we can have some aligned payment approaches with Medicare, which I think is pretty significant. 
Um, there are, it's a, it's a regional approach. And so we are thinking about different areas where that might be. These are some of our first thoughts, but uh, aren't necessarily the, the end, including North Central, Greater Columbia, and the Spokane area. The chart funding uh, is about $5 million to bring additional support to uh, the transformation activities. And uh, we are hoping to make this multi-payer, not just Medicaid and Medicare, and to incentivize primary care affordability and accountability regionally. Next slide. Yes, I think this is the end. So um, we are quite pleased with our efforts at moving the market. I think there was a question about why other payers aren't doing this. Um, we are hopeful that by taking the lead and um, making it easy for the plans that we contract with, that they can spread this to their other lives um, because we are the Washington's largest purchaser. And so we can help um, enable some of this transformation. Uh, we are really aligning with the national movement away from fee-for-service. Uh, I've mentioned in a couple other venues that I liken it to if a healthcare system is a car with a, um, a traditional healthcare being a car with a combustion engine, we are moving to an electric car. We are getting rid of the guts of the engine and we are moving to something new. And um, I am Judy, if you're able to hear me, it, sound, it seems like you might be frozen. I'm not sure if Sue is still there. Oh, Judy, I think you're back. Judy, you were frozen. I'd be happy to um, just make a few comments. I'm here, but maybe I'll turn off my uh, video. It's prime school time. So uh -huh. you know, our, uh, our internet is being stressed. <laughs> So this is Sue, I'll just um, chime in a little bit more for Judy, um, since her internet connection is a little unstable. Right there in downtown Tacoma, Judy, see, that's why I always just kind of report. Everybody go in and make sure you take the test at Department of Commerce, because we're really trying to infill with better broadband support. So um, a few things, there's a lot of comments in the chat box about what specifically in social determinant and equity areas is um, HCA doing. And there's quite a bit of partnership going on between the other health and human service agencies. The governor has a really significant poverty roundtable work group. And there are um, stipend individuals that participate in that and have crafted just a really great plan for how we move more cross sectorally, how we shift more resources into those evidence based social programs. But specifically, um, healthcare authority has the waiver in play that fuels uh, foundational community supports. And so that is for helping um, build up supportive housing and supportive employment. We've also filed two more initiatives about substance use, addiction, and for mental health treatment. So we have a lot going on to try to bring in more integrated behavioral health. And then lastly, I'll just say that we have a fabulous group that we'll talk about at another time that are really trying to um, rejigger all the infrastructure to look at food insecurity and how we can automate that more carefully in Washington so that we resolve the food insecurity issues. But really our focus has been housing, employment, and substance use, addiction, and mental health, behavioral health treatment. Great. Thank you both so much for being with us today and for sharing all of that wealth of information. We unfortunately probably do not really have time for Q&A, but Sue and Judy, if you're open, we may email you some questions that have come in through the chat box and then communicate out when we email the recording of this event and slides. So um, we can be, Ginny and I can be in touch with you on that going forward. So to everyone, we are going to take a quick break. Um, I'm just gonna pull up a break slide here. Um, originally, we had intended to come back at 9.40, but we're gonna come back at 9.45 to give everyone time to um, take some bio breaks. Thank you all for being with us and we'll see you in about five minutes. Thanks.
David Mielstein, I'm just checking that we have your audio working. If you could just say something. I am here. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Actually, same thing for you, Karen Johnson. We might as well try as well. I am here. Excellent. Can you hear me? And now can you see me? You know, let's see. Yes, we can. Fantastic. Okay. We're going to give people one more minute to come back and get started. And I'll let you know when I actually, you'll be able to tell because I'll pull up David's slides. Okay, fantastic. And David, I think you can turn your camera on whenever you want to. There you are. And Amy, I'll uh, run my own slides if that works. Okay, great. Then I am going to go ahead and promote you to um, co-host, which gives you the ability to grab a screen. So give me just one moment. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, which should allow you to grab the screen if you want to go ahead and do that. There we go. Great. Well, let me know when you're ready. Let me know when we're ready. I'm sorry, David, I spoke over you. I, I was think, saying the same thing. <laughs> I think we're ready. We're at 9.45, and so I think we can go ahead and get started. Fantastic. Well, welcome back, everyone. Um, many thanks to Dr. Don Berwick for his really inspirational and somewhat challenging opening. Um, and to the Healthcare Authority Director Superch and Chief Medical Officer Dr. Judy zerzan for their update on all the progress we are making and for the opportunities ahead of us and for their continued leadership. And um, before I introduce our next keynote presenter for the second half of this, David Mielstein, I want to turn to just one of the questions that was answered earlier because I thought it was really well posed. And of course, it came from Susie Date, our former Washington Health Alliance, and ask, you know, Dr. Berwick, for so much of your career, you have focused on fixing healthcare. Seems as though you have changed your tune, specifically what convinced you to do so, and how can we convince others to change the focus and priorities, including reallocation of resources? So um, Jenny's already communicated with Dr. Berwick. He's already responded. And I want to share that with you because I think it's a really important I think foundation for the rest of our conversation today. And his answer is, this should be and not or. I fully believe we should continue to improve healthcare with energy and avidity guided by the IOM's six aims for improvement. I am singing both tunes now, however. We will never achieve health unless and until we add enormous amounts of work on social determinants. So I just think that's a really good segue into the next part of our conversation where we really are focused on the delivery system and the fundamentals around the business models that drive the, the healthcare system that we have today. And I now have the honor of introducing to you our post-break um, presenter, David Muelstein. David is Chief Strategy and Research Officer for Levitt Partners, where he is responsible for the firm's strategic planning and leads their directed research efforts. David's research and expertise centers on healthcare payment and delivery transformation, understanding healthcare markets, and evaluating, evaluating how the broader healthcare system is changing. He regularly speaks and writes about healthcare system evolution and is a self-identified data nerd. I first heard David speak about a year ago go and can assure you he is a very impressive data nerd and be warned he may cause you to see things a bit differently today. And I just want to give you a heads up that following David's presentation, we will hear from local leaders who represent different provider perspectives on the challenges and opportunities around accelerating value-based payment adoption in Washington State. And I also want to remind you, you've been great about using the Q&A function for your questions. Please can continue to do that. And if you have any technical difficulties, please feel free to use the chat function. And David, now I turn it over to you. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Karen. And it is great to be with you today and to talk a little bit about what's going on in value-based care. And my objective for today is to help provide a perspective around why we both need to move to value-based care and also why we're not moving. And there's a confluence of both business and policy reasons that are prohibiting us from moving at the pace that many of us would like to see. And so as I go through, I wanna talk on four major bullets here. And it's starting with the need for value, leading to the barriers to why we can't do it from a policy perspective. Then looking at where we are today across the country and then talking about the delivery barriers that we're seeing today and what's really keeping organizations from making that transition to this model. 
But I want to start by going back in time and using a short history lesson on a company that many of you are very familiar with. And I would be willing to wager that at least one of you listening will uh, take advantage of their services while I am talking, and that is Amazon. If we go back to 1994, Amazon, when it started, was really just a web front end to a wholesale book catalog um, where you could go in and deliver an order online, but then get something shipped from a, from a publisher. Ten years later, it started to change a lot. They moved from just selling books to selling almost anything. And they had a relatively large presence. They still weren't profitable at the time, but they had a large presence and an increasing market share. Over the next decade, they continued to expand, but beyond just selling their own goods, they became a marketplace. And so now a majority of things that are sold on Amazon are not directly sold by Amazon, but it's by third party um, vendors that are going and using them as a marketplace or an access point to uh, sell uh, whatever they have. And then today they've continued to expand. They've moved beyond just traditional um, retail. They're doing things in uh, entertainment. They're doing things um, with healthcare. Uh, you know, the, the, um, some of the acquisitions and the investments they've made there. But they've now tried to move to everything in the uh, in our the consumers kind of day-to-day -day, uh, experience. One thing that most people don't know about Amazon though is that with all of the valuations and the growth, the growth potential is not in the consumer side. In 2019, they had $280 billion worth of revenue and $14 billion worth of profit, which is not bad. If you look though from their consumer focused sales side, that was $245 billion worth of revenue and only $5 billion of profit. That's about 2%. Okay, but certainly not remarkable. There's another business that Amazon has, a subsidiary that's called AWS, Amazon Web Services, that runs many of the websites that we see. It's a it's a business-to-business -business type uh, play, and it is very much behind the scenes. AWS did $35 billion of revenue and $9 billion of profit. So much more profitable than the rest of Amazon put together. And it's also growing at a faster rate and the profit is growing faster. The reason I use Amazon as an example is that sometimes we're so focused on the big things that are in front of us. That's the consumer facing side of Amazon that many of us use regularly, that we're not aware of what's happening behind the scenes. And in healthcare, it's a similar challenge where we're often focused on what we do on a day-to-day -day basis or what our industry um, uh, leaders are talking about that we're not always aware of the things that are behind the scenes but are very influential and really driving what's happening at a macro point of view. I also wanna share a quote. Um, in 1996, uh, Bill Gates wrote a book and he said, we often, overestimate the amount of change that we'll see in two years and underestimate the amount of change that we'll see in a decade. And we look at 1996, and this is the very beginning of the internet. And if you go from 1996 to 1998, what were the changes? You went from 10 free hours to 50 free hours of AOL. But from 1996 to 2006, the internet completely changed how we communicate as a society. Similarly, when we look at healthcare, we try to hope for change that's going to be significant and quick over the course of maybe a congressional election cycle. But the reality is it's not going to change that quick. But over the course of a decade, we will see dramatic changes that start to play out. Similar to how Amazon made dramatic changes over a decade, but very small changes year to year, we are also going to see that play out in healthcare. Now, when we think about healthcare, there's many different perspectives to look at. Anuve Reinhardt talked about the three facets of healthcare that I've modified just a little bit, but they talk about the clinical care, how we deliver care and interact with our patients, the financing, how it's being reimbursed for, and then the structure, how it's being organized for, through policies and organizations, and how does it work together? Now, the thing about a facet is that a facet is very fascinating. You can spend a lot of time looking at it. But if you think of an example of a diamond, a diamond is just an ugly little piece of rock until you cut the facets into it. But it's not the facets that shimmer and shine, it's where they come together. And the intersection of clinical care and financing or financing and the structure are where much change is playing out. 
And so what I want to do is try to tease out some of these big changes and some of these um, characteristics that are important and hopefully allow us to think of healthcare from a slightly different perspective. So we'll start with the need for value. Now, many of you have seen similar slides to this. This is looking how much Medic or how much the United States spends on healthcare as a percentage of the GDP. So it's about approaching 18%, which is significantly more than other, all other developed nations. These are OECD countries, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. One of the things we don't recognize though is that we spend more through government and compulsory care than any other country spends in the aggregate. So before we start going to out-of-pocket costs, we're already spending more than any other country. In, effect, at, or in, in actuality, we spend more for um, government spending through Medicare, Medicaid, and government employees than almost every other developed country spends in totality. And for those, many of those are able to provide care for their entire population, at least some measure of care. So how did we get to this? It certainly wasn't fast. This is looking at the history of government expenditures. Remember that Medicare was passed, Medicare and Medicaid were passed in 1965, where just over 5% of government spending was going toward healthcare. We fast forward to today and it's about a third. So how did we get that? Well, there's a couple of different things that play into it. One is that there are tend to be a few more people that are in Medicare and Medicaid. But that's actually not the real story because this similar line plays out when we look at total spend on healthcare. And what this is, is the compounding impact of interest, if you will, or inflation. So there's always a natural rate of inflation within the economy. And we tend to grow up and prices are more. You buy more with a dollar in 1950 than you can buy for a dollar in 2020. But inflation, is different than medical inflation. The medical inflation is the rate of the cost that we're paying for a basket of medical goods and services. And what you can see is that over the past 70 years, medical inflation has grown 1.7% faster than total inflation on average. So what happens with the compounding uh, imp or impact of this? Well, to put it in comparison, we spend 18% of our GDP on healthcare today. If medical inflation had grown at the same rate of total inflation, of, of overall inflation, we would be spending between five and 6% on healthcare. That's what happens when you get into a trend and you continue in that trend for 70 years. So how does this play out? How does it impact us today? This is looking at how the government spends money. Four major categories. Three of these are mandatory. One of those is discretionary. Healthcare, interest, and social security are all mandatory spending. It means there's legislation that's passed that requires the government to spend on this. The green category is discretionary spending, something that you have to pass a budget for. You don't have to pass a budget to pay for Medicare. What happens if you, um, increase your spending on healthcare, the interest in social security? Well, it means you have to spend either less for everything else that goes into that discretionary bucket, or you have to borrow more money. Now, this is based on the law at the time of the projection. So it was the 2019 projection saying, this is what happens if the law doesn't change. But we know that the law changes. Government is really poor at decreasing how much they pay. So what do they do? they go into the deficit and they increase the deficit. And then when things that happen, such as a pandemic, they really, really, really expand the deficit spending. So what that means is that orange bar is going to increase. That orange category is going to increase as we pay more for interest. That means that we're going to either have to continue to borrow more or we're gonna to have to reduce spending or at least slow the growth of spending a certain extent. And since healthcare is the largest of all of these buckets, that is the one that's a focus. And so there's an economic, a government imperative to try to reduce the, how much we're spending on healthcare, or at least keep it from growing. If we don't, if we don't change the law, then this is how much change we'd have to reduce for discretionary spending in the next year, it'd be 5%. And over 10 years, it would have to be reduced by 25%. This means we'd have to reduce spending on defense, 
education, environment, everything else would have to be reduced by 25%. It's really realistically not in the deck of cards where government is going to do that. So another compelling reason, well, we know that Medicare is an incredibly popular program for beneficiaries. It also though has to be paid for and it's largely paid for by um, uh, through payroll taxes. When it was passed in 1965, the projection is that it would last forever. People that were working today would pay into a trust fund, and then that trust fund would ultimately pay out and go towards what was happening uh, for those that were retired. Well, things started to change. One is people started to live longer, so they spent more years on Medicare. Other, the cost trend kept going up, 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 and up. And so in the early 1980s, we got to a point where it was five years away from where this trust fund was expected to be exhausted. So what did Medicare do in 1982? It passed a bill that required the creation of prospective payments. And then in 1983, it required the adoption of these prospective payments. These are DRGs, which later moved on to outpatient care as well. But there was this prospective payment instead of purely fee-for-service, where you spend an extra day in the hospital, you paid more money. Okay, that bought some time. 15 years later though, it started to go again. This was the cost, this was the utilization, there were more Medicare beneficiaries and the prices kept going up. And so in 1997, the Balanced Budget Act said, well, let's try to change how things are and limit Medicare to growing at the rate of general inflation. That was that bill that you saw earlier, that we, or that, that graph you saw earlier that says, let's just pay and only increase at the same rate of general inflation. Well, that worked out really well during the dot-com boom, but as soon as the dot-com boom ended and our, company, our country wasn't growing at the same exponential rate that it had been for the previous few years, then we would have to make cuts. And for those of you that have lived, or remember living through the sustainable growth rate battles, you realize that those cuts didn't happen. The Affordable Care Act bought some more time in 2010, but many of those things like the medical device tax and the Cadillac tax actually weren't in are, are ever implemented. And so it was a very short um, gain of time, but then it started to decline over time. Then the Budget Control Act increased how much we pay for Medicare and actually cut um, some of Medicare payments. Um, and so we, we bought some time, but that gets us to this year. Early this year, when the Medicare trustees released their report, they said that the Medicare trust fund was going to be exhausted in 2026, only six years away. Well. If you've forgotten, we've gone through a little bit of a rough economic patch. And during that rough economic patch as part of this pandemic, we have reduced how much we, how many people are employed, which means we're reducing how much is being brought in in payroll taxes. And so the Congressional Budget Office did a revised estimate, and that puts us at a four-year time frame. That means that as of today, we're expected to be exhausted by 2024. What does that mean? What that means is that we are the closest to exhausting the trust fund that we've ever been. If we don't act soon, we have a real issue of not being able to provide care for Medicare beneficiaries. And I can just tell you, nobody has ever won president, the presidency by promising to kill Medicare. So since we know there's this problem, why don't we just fix it? There's a number of challenges. One is the amount that we're spending on care. The amount that we spend, the co cost of care is based on the volume that we spend and the prices that we're paying for those. The United States is a very low utilizer of care. As you can look at this, we use a quarter of the care of Korea in terms of how many times we interact with a physician in the average year. We also go to the hospital much less. And when we go to a hospital, we spend significantly less time in the hospital. Since we are lower utilizers than many other countries, why are we so much more? That's the prices. And many of you have seen the, are familiar with, it's the prices stupid, where the Medicare spends significantly more, or uh, the healthcare system spends significantly more for the same service than they do in other countries. Compared to the United Kingdom, we spend twice as much for a relatively standard procedure, an appendectomy. And if you compare something like a cabbage, coronary artery bypass graft, we spend five times as much as Spain. And I can assure you that we don't have five times the outcomes. 
Actually, in terms of most care, we are right in the average stand. There are some areas we're a little worse, some areas we're a little better, but we are not significantly better than these other developed nations. When we look at pharmaceutical drugs, we spend significantly more on these drugs as well. Though the reality is that drugs don't account for a huge percentage of our total spend on healthcare. It's about 11%. So if we could make every pharmaceutical drug free, we would reduce spending by 11%. And after about five years of medical inflation, we would have offset that. That's the challenge that we're at. But just the pricing isn't the only issue. We also have challenges with incentives. If you're a hospital system and you have a budget that you need to meet to be able to keep the lights on, here's your comparisons. An average primary care visit is paid $59, at least in 2017. This was using um, uh, Medicare claims data. And it was almost $12,000 for a hospitalization, the average hospitalization. That means if you lose one hospitalization, you would have to offset that with 200 primary care visits. The incentives are to continue to focus on what's highly reimbursed. And what's highly reimbursed is hospitalizations, surgeries, other procedures. There's very limited financial incentive to do preventative or proactive outpatient care. Another challenge we have is the distribution of costs. The top 1% of healthcare spenders accounts for 22% of the total spend on health. The top 5% is about 50%. The bottom 50%, so this is if you look at everybody from the cheapest to the most expensive in America, the bottom 50% collectively account for 3% of total expenditures. A challenge we have in America is we want to make policies that are applicable to everybody. One example of this is health savings accounts. It has been proven that people that have quote unquote skin in the game, where they have to pay out of pocket or pay through some sort of a health insurance program, if there is skin in the game, they are less likely to go after and receive that care. The problem is that the people that are influenced by that tend to fall in that bottom 50%. If you are, for example, diagnosed with cancer, have a heart attack, and a major automobile accident, first of all, you're in a lousy position to shop around for services. Second of all, you know you're going to hit your maximum out of pocket, and you're going to just go in and get the care that you need. So these high spenders have no incentive to do that. And so people hang all their hopes on these health savings accounts, ignoring the fact that that's only going to impact a very small percentage of the spend even if it's a large percentage of the people. Another challenge is the persistence. If you look at the people that are in the top 10% of healthcare costs, between 25 and 45% of them will just be in the top 10% the next year. The reason is because people tend to either get better or they die. And that's the challenge that we have. The last challenge that we'll have is that there is a strong policy reason to not try to reduce the growth of healthcare. Over the last 40 years, you can look at the change in industry employment. Manufacturing has been cut in half, while healthcare on the other side of this has increased by almost 50%. This is the largest five industries that we have in the country. But a way to look at that is looking at the largest industry by state. If you go back to 1990, we were largely a manufacturing, and that's that orange color. We were a manufacturing country. Over time, we started to move forward. And in 2000, we were more of a, uh, or 2005, we were more of a split country. We still had a lot of manufacturing in the Midwest. We had a lot of retail. It was more in the West. And then we started to have a number of states that were healthcare focused. Well, what happened between 2005 and 2010? Well, it was the Great Recession. The Great Recession hit retail and manufacturing really really hard. And in those five years, we became a healthcare country. If we go forward and take it to the end of 2019, we realized that healthcare is the largest industry in 45 of the states. We've got three manufacturing holdouts, though healthcare is very close to surpassing in each of those states. And then we have Nevada and Hawaii that are driven by hospitality or, or recreation. What does this mean? 
It means that what has largely driven the growth of our economy, the strength of our economy for the last 15 years through both Democratic and Republican administrations has been healthcare. We have the competing challenge which says, we will be fiscally irresponsible if we do not address this growth in healthcare costs. It's a tension. And how does this tension play out? The reality is that the tension has largely played out in favor of economic growth. Whenever there's a plan that comes into place that says we're going to reduce how much we spend in healthcare or even reduce the increase of growth of healthcare, trade associations, specialty societies, and thousands and millions of healthcare workers will go and talk to their members of Congress and say, this is going to hurt jobs. People don't get elected on a platform of cutting jobs. So what do we do? Well, this is why people say that value-based care is so imperative. Value-based care changes the incentives a little bit. It's encouraging us not to just focus on the volume of care and maximizing that, but actually focusing on keeping people healthy. The theory of this is that if you pay differently, that's payment reform, then providers change their behavior and that leads to the better outcomes known as delivery or the, uh, the triple aim. This is what um, Dr. Bergwick was talking about. We want better outcomes and experience and lower costs. This is the, the objective. The challenge is twofold. The first one is that it's hard to get payment models right. And we've been experimenting with payment models for a very long time. If you look at the Massachusetts Alternative Quality Contract that launched in 2009, even before the ACA, we have more than a decade of experience but it's difficult. But as for hard as that is, delivery reform is even harder. There is no magic light switch that you turn on and health systems dramatically improve the delivery of care. Most providers, if there was an obvious way to provide better care for their patients, they would leap for it. But it takes time and effort. And it also is a recognition of the weaknesses of the fee-for-service system and the barriers that it puts into place for people that are trying to change the delivery of care. So how are we doing with growth over time? This is through the uh, fourth quarter of this year. You see that we have flatlined in terms of the number of ACOs and the number of lives that are at risk. We've also got to a problem where there is not consistency around the country. If you're looking at the number of ACOs, that's just the count that largely tracks by population. But if you look at the percent of the population on the right, many very large states have a very small percent of their population that's covered by these contracts. It's about 13% um, nationally, but in certain large population states, it might be below 5%. And it's really hard to make substantive changes when you have very few lives that are fully at risk under these population-based models, where you have providers that are responsible for the cost and quality outcomes of a defined population. So how are we doing with those that do exist? This is looking at the Medicare Shared Savings Program. And you look at, on average, we're seeing a net savings of about 1%. Now, 1% is great if we're able to do that relative to a, some sort of a baseline, but it's still lower than our 70 year average of medical inflation. And there's also a time frame whereby you can continue to reduce the savings um, based on that, that um, trend line. There's also a desire that we'd love to see very good outcomes and very good quality results and that they'll come together. The reality is that quality and savings are largely unrelated. This is your definition of a scattershot graph. But I actually think that's liberating. The reason is that we can create policies and programs that improve quality and other policies and programs that include, they address the cost of care. It's really hard when you have to solve the cost and quality problem with one stone, as opposed to using two stones for two different birds. So what's it going to take? What is it going to take at the provider level to make this change? And I want to talk about three different things that factor into this, the payment models, the care delivery, and ultimately the business case. First of all, payment models 
play out in many different ways. You have direct to provider payments, there's uh, consumerism, there's transparency. All of these things need to be iterated on. And I encourage all of you that are working on this to continue to study it out, find out what, what works and what doesn't work and then iterate. But I don't think it's the payment models that are holding it back. The next is improve how you manage a population. And as I mentioned earlier, this takes a lot of time. And I really think that it is a transformation that takes years and years to change the delivery of care. I would put it at a decade or longer for an organization to make that transformation. A key framework is to start with your population, identify its needs, create appropriate intervention pop opportunities, and then partner. The reality is that no healthcare provider can fulfill all of the needs of their population because many of those needs, as we talked about earlier, are not medical in nature. They're societal and they relate to the social determinants of health and other things. And so you need to expand how you think about this population care and think about it more broadly. Those interventions cannot be understated in their importance. The fastest way to lose money is to provide meaningful, helpful interventions for patients that don't need them. And being able to identify what those needs are for a population are critical for the success of these models. I think we are making a lot of progress. Now, let me phrase that. I know we're making a lot of progress on managing populations and understanding what population health is. We need to do more, but that's not the biggest barrier. The biggest barrier is the business case. Because most people think that if we get the payment models and delivery systems in place, magically that light switch is now going to flip and we're going to move toward a value focused world. We can't because there are major roadblocks that we need to get through. We'll start with the prior investments. This is looking at hospitals using 2017 cost reports and uh, more recent cost reports are not going to uh, tell a very different story. Hospitals in the country have $756 billion of fixed assets and $329 billion, about 45% of that is in long-term liabilities. Think of this as the mortgages that they're paying off for their hospitals. Their net income is only $39 billion. Most hospitals systems in the country have long-term debts that they have to pay off. And when you have a long-term debt associated with your hospital, your facility, your physical asset, you're committed to a certain way of doing business. To put this in comparison, if we looked at all of the hospital beds in the country, there is $325,000 of long-term debt associated with every short-term hospital bed in the country. People are locked into paying that off. And that leads to a worldview that needs to shift, but it's hard to. The historical worldview was around identifying the well-reimbursed services, building capacity, usually with physical assets, and then filling that capacity. That's why every time you go down the freeway in any city in America, you see signs for the best hospitals. And it could be, go to their emergency room, go to their heart hospital, go to their oncology cancer center, go to their ambulatory surgery center and get your best knee replacement possible. It's because people have invested in these models and they do it largely through bonds. For-profits use corporate bonds, not-for-profits use community bonds. And they commit for a very long time. Most of these bonds are 20, 30, or 50 year bonds. And in at least three situations I know of, they're 100 year bonds. People are making multi-generational commitments to a capacity focused worldview. The alternative focus is starting with the needs of the patient and building the services around them and preventing the high cost care. We have a very large healthcare system today and it's hard to move away from one very clearly established business model to a new business model. But there are organizations that are making a lot of progress. Landmark Health, Care More, Chin Med, Oak Street Health. These are organizations that don't have a legacy business model that they have to build out. They're starting with the needs. Now, most of these uh, organizations focus on high needs patients, but I expect that over time, they're going to expand and be able to provide care for low needs patients. Those, the 50% of people that account for 3% of spend that largely don't need any healthcare services. The last area is the governance, particularly with not-for-profit healthcare systems. 
Leaders are tasked with increasing their market share, improving their margin, and improving their brand within their community. We need boards of directors to say, no, what we're going to hold our administrators responsible to is lowering the cost of care and decreasing the amount of services that are even needed within our community, focusing on the health of the population as opposed to competing with the not or for the for with the for-profit health system down the block. This takes a major redesign in the expectation of boards. So how do we do it? The way that we will be successful with this transition is starting with a vision, a vision that there is a better way of providing care. Having a meaningful business plan. If you don't have a business plan that makes sense, you will never be able to make change that is lasting. What you'll do is work under grants and when the grant money dries up, all of your work will evaporate. So you need a business plan that makes sense. And third, you need to be consistent. You need to focus on this, not for a one to two year quick evolution, but for a 10 year transformation that will ultimately lead to better outcomes. And with that, I will stop and uh, turn it over to Karen. David, thank you so much for that rich presentation. And thank you all in the audience for your many questions that have come in. In the interest of time, I'm gonna keep us moving. David has agreed to stay around for questions with our panel that are coming up next. And I'm gonna quickly turn to them. And they're gonna share their thoughts about how to accelerate the adoption of value-based payments, each speaking from their unique perspective as providers. I think the thing that David points out about the, it's really futile for us to expect care to be delivered differently without addressing the underlying business models and the financial incentives that created what we see today and we're frankly trying to undo and change. So we've challenged our speakers to speak from their unique perspectives as providers around how to accelerate adoption of value-based payment and really address population health in a more meaningful way um, from their unique perspectives. We've challenged them to identify at least one lever for change that they can activate that's specifically within their control. We've also asked them to identify levers of change that they would ask others to activate and that by doing so together kind of operates like the facets that David was describing, the different aspects of healthcare coming together in a meaningful way. So they will introduce themselves and their organizations in a bit more depth. So I'm just going to give you a quick rundown of who you are about to hear from. First up is Karen Sharpman. She is CFO and VP of Strategy for Kaiser Permanente Washington, which is, um, as you might suspect, representative of the integrated delivery system as a business model. Next, we are pleased to have Lloyd David, president of Western Washington Group for Optum, um, and a member of the Alliance Board. Thank you, Dave Lloyd, for that. Um, and the, his group includes the Poly Clinic and the Everett Clinic. Everett Clinic. Lloyd speaks from the perspective of a physician-led multi-specialty physician group. After Lloyd, we will hear from David LaMarche, who is Chief Administrative Officer of the Eastside Health Network, a physician-led clinically integrated network formed in 2017. Eastside Health Network includes independent physicians, along with employed physicians from Evergreen Health and Overlake Medical Center. It is a model built specifically to take on and succeed under new value-based payment models. So it'll be really interesting to hear from David. And last, but certainly not least, we will hear from Rebe Rebecca Cavusi, who is the regional president for Landmark Health, who just got a shout out from David Muelstein. Landmark Health is focused on a highly customized care delivery model for a small um, segment, um, that very high utilizing segment of the population that David was pointing out, who have multiple chronic conditions condition and whose health needs would often be attended to in the emergency room without the kind of customized proactive model provided by Landmark Health. They of course represent the new market entrant unencumbered by the incentives of fee-for-service and we look for, forward to hearing from all of them and we turn now to Karen Sharpman. So Karen you can turn your camera on. There you go. Good to see all you. All right. Thank you. Thank you Karen. I am delighted to be here. Thank you for the invitation. These presentations have been amazing. I'm Karen Shortman. I have 33 years with Kaiser Permanente, all in finance seats. I've been a CFO in several of our regions over the past 10 years. At this point in my career, I have a very deep and broad understanding of the economic elements of value in our model. So today I'd like to illuminate that and really speak to what are some of the obstacles we face despite our model and what, we, what can we do differently? So first I'll start with a brief orientation to Kaiser Permanente. I'm sure 
Most of you in, in this meeting today understand a little bit about Kaiser Permanente. Uh, I'm gonna talk briefly about our business model, but, but I, I want to talk about two elements that are vitally important uh, throughout our history. And those are number one, our ultimate aims as an organization or our mission. And, and the second element is governance, which David spoke about and is vitally important. So, so we go back to the 1930s in this country and we were founded on a premise that everyone should have access to equitable and affordable healthcare, period. That, that is why we are here today. Everything else was designed around that. Um, our second hospital that we started up was actually here in the state of Washington at the site of the Grand Coulee Dam. It's still there today, it's changed ownership. Uh, but the premise behind it was that workers who were uh, building the infrastructure of this country should have access to healthcare without regard to their ability to pay. It, it, was, it needed to be provided to them. And, and secondly, uh, a key premise from, from, our, from inception was around equitable care. So, so back in those days, hospitals actually had different levels of accommodation based on your ability to, to pay. And we changed that. And I call it out because these things, if you come into Kaiser Permanente, this is the air that we breathe. It influences everything we do. I'm, I'm showing our beliefs here, which Bernard Tyson led a process um, over the last several years, and he is unfortunately no longer with us, but leading our organization to really re-energize around our beliefs. And, and these guide everything we do. And without that, nothing would be possible. David spoke about governance. Governance is vital. Boards need to drive the outcomes that we are seeking. At Kaiser Permanente, one of the secrets behind our model is we have a common board that spans hospital and health plan. It is one board, it's the same board, and it drives the things that David called out. We've got to bring nation leading quality at a lower cost, and we have to eliminate health disparities. That is also the air that we live and breathe that guides us every day and it's, it's vitally powerful. But, but, but then the, the core of us is the business model. So how do you do all of that? And, and here are the elements. They're, they're, I think these are obvious on, on the outside of the organization. Uh, we, we are a nonprofit, 501c3. Uh, most of our rev revenue comes from global capitation. This enables us to manage the care of populations and managing, manage the financing of that care. Here's one that's probably not visible, always on the outside, but, but we are a physician-led organization for care decisions. And, and our organizations are physicians, which are an independent medical group with a separate board. Uh, they drive all of our care decisions. And we, we engineer for quality, we embrace data. Our model drives our focus on health prevention and clinical preventive services. This is hardwired into our DNA. So this is the essence of our model and the, the key ingredients that make it happen. Despite this, we have obstacles today. We have obstacles as we try to lower, lower our costs. And we have a very strong mission today around lowering. We, healthcare should trend at lower than the rate of inflation. Healthcare should, should not approach the level that consumers pay on housing, which is that and healthcare has surpassed what a consumer household spends on food. Those are outcomes we need to drive away. So what are our obstacles? Um, number one is with employers, uh, which is surprising. And we're an organization that started to serve employers. Employers need to demand value Today, there's a demand for choice and flexibility versus value, and, and, and that needs to change uh, for, for us to be successful in, in our goals. The second one is, is with regulators. While pushing for value in the AC and the uh, Washington Health Authority showed some very strong things that they are doing to move in this direction, but while pushing for value, government is also increasing taxes and mandates in the short term, this causes economic tension. And those taxes and mandates have been disproportionately on capitated care. We're, we are all aligned around the end result. And this is largely aimed at, we've got to eliminate health disparities. 
So let's focus on how do we eliminate health disparities and, and get behind that. We are absolutely behind that. And we have to make sure that the economics don't disrupt organizations that are, that are seeking to do that. Uh, the third thing is, um, you know, um, Don Berwick called out, I was really um, pleased to see in his presentation, he called out the issue around proximity to care. And drive time standards have been prevalent, a prevalent underpinning to economics and healthcare and very well intended and very appropriate in, in most cases. But, but with the world of technology now, it opens up our ability to look at how can we solve for proximity in a way that increases competition to help ensure that we can deliver lower prices uh, despite um, you know, proximity to physical um, areas for care. And, and I believe that this is a huge untapped value lever. Uh, the reality is uh, we, we and others in the healthcare system are exposed to monopolistic influences that do for, for reasons often very well intended that do drive um, higher costs. Um, so, what, so what can we do differently? We, we have some key levers in our control and I'm gonna highlight two. The first one is, you know, really one of the downsides of capitation that we have to own is that it has not been transparent. So we need to own making transparent the elements of cost within a capitated framework. And, and that also leads to, we have to be able to eliminate the economic investments in driving health outcomes because that's vital. Uh, a former CEO of Kaiser Permanente, George Halverson was an amazing leader. And one of his talking points he would say, and I'm gonna translate this into the ICD-10 world. You know, we have 140,000 codes that exquisitely detail the elements of treating disease. Right, and, and we have zero codes in our in fee schedules that illuminate the value of health. And, and we, we need to change that balance. We need to start to value health and value it as an ingredient of our economic model and make that transparent. It is worthy of investment. It is worthy of a, a, an appropriate amount of our healthcare dollars going to improving health and sustaining health. Um, what is not in our control, or let me go to what can we do differently? Um, so I talked about the first one. The second one is something that we've done from day one is uh, using uh, innovation to improve quality of care and drive economic outcomes. So I'll give you a, a and we've done that through our inception. Within a capitated framework, we can directly make those trade-offs, again, with the strong uh, board directives around, around quality and lower cost. So today we are leveraging telehealth. Uh, as we looked at what purchases would need in the coming year, given, given the current situation, uh, we've had to double down on affordability. So, so we are driving out new products um, in, in our market, leveraging telehealth in a way that reduces cost. Telehealth can be used to reduce cost if we were tied to um, parity for telehealth payments and really needing to focus on making sure we could sustain our revenue as we drove telehealth, we would not be able to achieve this goal. But we are re-engineering our cost structure within our value-based models so that we can lower costs. And we have brought rate reductions uh, to the individual and family line of business next year. And we're uh, really, really, really pleased with the potential that we have ahead of us there. Um, what is not in our control is, uh, we, we've talked about it, other speakers have talked about it, we need purchasers and government and labor to prioritize value. The healthcare authority spoke to this. They are doing it. Uh, we need to double down on this. We need everyone in the market demanding this. Uh, that includes reducing waste and driving bundled uh, pricing and capitation. Um, we've got to make sure that every, everything is lined up to do that. And even, even um, with some of the, the new changes rolling out, we still have elements of pricing that is tied to fee for service. And until we can depart from that, uh, we're, we're going to have barriers to our progress in truly delivering value-based care. So I will stop there. Thank you very much.
Karen, thank you so much for that. Really appreciate it. Um, I think that you underscore the importance of the provider having the ability to make trade-offs in different payment models, which is, I think, an element that we're going to talk more about. And now I'm going to turn quickly to Lloyd David um, from Optum to give his perspective as a, as a multi-specialty physician group. Thank you for being here, Lloyd. Well, thanks very much for having me. Uh, is audio okay, Karen? I'm going to take that yeah, we got you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Susie David for asking the follow-up question to Don Berwick and for you guys for sharing it. Because by the time he was done, I was thinking I spent my career working in the wrong part of social justice. I should, uh, but I think his answer that it's and uh, was reaffirming. I want to say just a little bit about myself for starters. Um, I earlier in my career worked at Harborview Medical Center. I went to work at the Poly Clinic in 1994 when healthcare was happening at that point and have always been excited about being part of making healthcare better. Uh, the Poly Clinic was a founding member of the Washington Healthcare Alliance and, and I actually served as vice chair and a founding board member of that. And, and so I, I say that as a reflection of uh, personal and organizational commitment to value. Um, the reason we were so enthusiastic about the Alliance uh, when it was launched was because it put payers and purchasers and providers at the same table. And that was a very rare thing. Um, if you can go to the next slide. So I want to, many of you know me as the CEO of the Poly Clinic. So when Karen introduced me as from Optima, I wanted to be sure everyone understands. In early 2019, the Poly Clinic joined Optum. Optum is the other half of the United Health Group. On one side is United Health Insurance, on the other side is Optum. Uh, Everett Clinic uh, joined a few months later uh, as part of a transaction from the DeVita Medical Group. Uh, and in earlier this year, I became the president of Western Washington, essentially the CEO for both the Everett Clinic and the Poly Clinic. So today, those two organizations have serve about 600,000 patients. Um, in addition, what you see on the bottom of that slide is Optum Care Network. So both the Poly Clinic and the Everett Clinic had uh, independent practice associations, managed care companies that focused on Medicare Advantage uh, and global risk contracting. We are merging those two companies into a new one called Optum Care Network Washington. And so it will, all of our, value, our capitated contracts will go through Optum Care Network Washington. And next year, we expect to start with next year with well over 100,000 capitated lives, uh, primarily in Medicare Advantage, but also in uh, Medicaid, Medicare. Uh, if you include, uh, so every clinic and poly clinic today range from Anacortes down to Puyallup. And if you include Optum Care Network, we could go down to Clark County. So we are a substantial presence in the market and, and we will, I think, get larger and larger over time. And quite frankly, I think we're the best chance for real change in healthcare in Washington State. And I'll say a little bit more about why I make that bold statement. Boy. Uh, yeah. This is Karen. I'm going to just going to introduce you or interrupt you. I apologize quickly to say we are having a little bit of inconsistency in your sound. If you could stay close to your mic or speak up, that would be really helpful so everyone can hear the important message that you have to deliver. So I'm going to try a different device and see if that makes a difference, Karen. Hold on. Okay, well, that didn't work. So um, I am close to the mic, but I will get even closer to the mic. And, um, so next slide, please. So we are the largest non-health system medical group in the state. And it is a truly integrated multi-specialty group with primary care at the center. And, and I think primary care is absolutely central to the future. Um, but I also think that word coordinated care is essential. And coordination is such a boring word and so critical to what we need to achieve. Uh, both of our organizations have a long history in managing risk in value-based payment. Uh, we did capitation in the 90s. Uh, we've done full risk Medicare Advantage uh, since the 90s. The Poly Clinic runs a, a, a clinically integrated network that has five uh, value-based contracts for commercial contracts. Um, and especially important, uh, we joined Optum both because of their strategic focus on value and because of the range of capabilities they have in terms of analytics, pharmacy, a range of care delivery services, all of which are commercially available, uh, but um, which we have a chance to partner with very closely. And we thought that joining Optum would help us accelerate um, the path of progress for us. 
Um, let me just, I, uh, before I get to the obstacles, I want to say that I, I think one of the things I noticed about healthcare is for all the large organizations, our strategies look very similar. We are all investing substantially in primary care. Uh, we are all um, integrating behavioral health in with primary care. Um, we're beginning to do, make outreach to organizations that we can partner with around social determinants of health. Uh, and so I think a lot of the question is how far can we go? How fast can we go? And I think David's comments about the business model, and I would argue that the payment model and the business model are closely linked, are really critical. And having been at this for a long time, there are days when I feel like, why haven't we made more progress? And then other days, I think, you know, uh, I can look, if I look back far enough, I can see, you know, we have all of our data electronic. We can actually measure quality and we can report on that. Uh, we have analytic capabilities we never had before. We can actually assess the severity of patients and we can do uh, risk profiling. So we've made a lot of progress, but we need to make more and we need to make it faster. So if I could talk, I'll say a few words about um, barriers. And, and let me say, first of all, one of my great frustrations is how almost every payer um, talks about how many of their payments are value-based. And while that's technically true, the vast, and we have value-based contracts, we have a Medicare ACO, um, but outside of Medicare Advantage, I will tell you that um, the vast majority of our revenue is still comes from doing things, okay? The amount money we get for value-based payments is frosting on a cake, but it's not a cake. And um, I don't wanna sound you know, uh, like it's all about dollars, but, but David's comments about aligning the payment model and the business model I think are really critical. So I just picked two barriers to speak about. One is uh, the ASOs, um, especially in this state and especially in Western Washington, we have a number of large employers uh, for whom the payers are uh, essentially a pass-through entity. And so those employers want, often make up their own rules and they don't, they have the freedom to not participate in value-based programs that the payers create. Uh, it puts the payers in many ways um, in a situation where it's harder for them to move us away from fee-for-service. And I do believe that fee-for-service is a substantial barrier to progress. On the other side, um, there are really minimal incentives, or not nearly enough incentives for patients, uh, employees, members of health plans. Uh, to this day, uh, people are very reluctant to incent, let alone require, people to, ch to choose a primary care physician, even if there's no referrals required, no barriers, um, there's just a great reluctance to do that. And I think without a connection to primary care, uh, patients will search uh, expensively and appropriately for the right care. And I think there are not enough incentives to steer people to the optimal care setting. Uh, the copay for going to a freestanding ASC should be less to one that's at a higher cost facility base. And that's just one example, uh, but the incentive to choose the more cost-effective setting. And I know we want patients to be consumers and we want them to price shop. And we know that they don't do it very well yet. And we know that's probably because our financing system is so very, very complicated. And so if you can move to the next slide. So what needs to happen uh, on our end? And I, I threw this out just uh, one you know, we are moving in further in this direction. I want to be sure, we need to be sure that that specialists are aligned with this uh, this focus on value. So today we actually uh, reward uh, our specialists for ordering a mammogram, for ordering an overdue diabetes test. Uh, we should be in a position where it makes sense for an orthopedist to spend extensive time counseling and coaching a patient on weight loss that might prevent the need or postpone for years the need for knee replacement surgery. Now, what I think we really need to do on the provider side is keep investing in primary care, keep putting the right resources in place to support primary care clinicians, but we need to do that in a very focused way. Um, not everybody needs a medical home, not everybody needs a care manager, and we need to use our analytics and our provider judgment to target those resources to the patients who will really benefit from those resources. But we do need to move our risk-based payment, it's a risk-based payment to providers where there are more dollars at stake uh, for not doing a good job or for doing a great job. The, the frosting on the cake I described makes us too hesitant to make the investments that you really want to make. And we do it, but all of us and, and do it within what we believe are 
the parameters that make us assure financial sustainability. And as I said, uh, I think payers and employers need to do more to promote primary care, to promote the identity connection with primary care, because uh, it's not going away no matter how digital things get. Uh, and to incent people to choose the right setting for their care. And lastly, and David made this point, there, I, um, I think it's an enormous challenge for the hospital systems. Um, they have a, a, a tremendous vulnerability in terms of their facility expenses. And frankly, I think it's up to the payers and, and purchasers to find some way to facilitate that transition. Because if I were the CFO for one of those health systems, I would be advising caution about ups, upsetting our business model and our, our long-term sustainability. I hope my audio got better as I lean forward and uh, I'll hand the microphone back. Thanks. Lloyd, thank you so much. And yes, I think we got, got your comments. And David, I'm going to just turn quickly to you as the Chief Administrative Officer for Eastside Health Network, who's been doing a lot of work with value-based payments and I think can share an interesting perspective. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, hopefully the audio is good. Uh, so uh, first and foremost, I just want to say thank you. It's a privilege and an, uh, an honor to be part of this group um, and uh, to share opportunities uh, that we see with, uh, with everybody on the, the event, as well as, uh, I think, a themed uh, response from my colleagues on the panel. Uh, so uh, I've been with uh, Eastside Health Network since uh, about May of 2017. Uh, the network is fairly new uh, in all reality, about uh, almost four years. Um, and yet we really didn't get started until the, the summer of 2017. Uh, since that time, uh, we've seen pretty substantial growth and number of covered lives as well as the network itself. So, um, you know, when we think about how we do this and what our approach is, we're really a provider driven network. The board is comprised of providers uh, and the leadership is comprised uh, from a decision-making standpoint of leader of uh, providers. Uh, you know, the, the structure of EHN is geared uh, specifically to manage, engage, and perform well within value-based contracts or value-based purchasing arrangements. Uh, yes, there are the, the revenue stream of fee-for-service that the providers still realize and the hospitals still realize, but we don't have a portion of that. So, um, ours is really to take responsibility of how that cost is uh, accumulated across all the, the various buckets. Overall, we have about 63,000 or so covered lives currently. Uh, we we towed our water or towed our, ourselves into uh, Medicare Advantage in 2019 and have seen uh, good success in that space, and we're learning a tremendous amount. Uh, we do have about 50,000 uh, commercial ACO lives, including a uh, deal with Microsoft. Um, I think the important piece too, from a provider composition standpoint of uh, members within EHN is 60% of our providers are independent. So this really for us means that uh, it's not um, uh, solely driven by a couple of integrated delivery systems, uh, but really it's a comprehensive aligned coordinated experience uh, from a leadership and, and network composition standpoint. Uh, we've also taken the approach um, of really making sure that the resources that we bring to bear to improve quality, to improve cost, to improve patient experience, include uh, resources that are directly tethered to primary care uh, and, and have shared care plans and shared objectives in which they work uh, virtually as a provider extender uh, to work with patients and have found such great value in that space. Um, and then finally, uh, the, the final bullet on this slide, targeting value to support independent practices. And I, and I would even put that at a hierarchy of independent practices, first and foremost, that are primary care. Uh, we spend an inordinate amount of time with our primary care providers, um, and we'll talk a little bit about what that looks like. Go ahead and go to the next slide, thanks. So what uniquely do we bring? Well, again, we're, we're a broad cross-section of healthcare providers in the marketplace. We do have Evergreen and Overlake as our uh, key stakeholders uh, from a network, um, a network uh, size. And yet at the same time, we have independent provider groups that are down to a single specialist or a single primary care provider. And, and the, the differences that they require and contribute to the network um, are, are really vast. And so it, it really creates some uh, opportunity for us to look at things from many, many different lenses. I think you add to that, that we're in a bunch of different contracting arrangements. So we do have Medicare Advantage contracts that are incentive-based and, and um, have an opportunity for shared savings. 
We have regular shared savings contracts with uh, commercial payers. We have up and downside uh, ECO contracts um, that we participate in or that we hold. And then uh, employee plans uh, as well that are basically functioning as a, a kind of a pseudo cap um, in, in our work. Um, all of this together really allows us to test and iterate. And, and I think when we look at how do we improve quality or how do we improve patient engagement, how do we do some of the things that are meaningful from a cost standpoint, we have a lot of different areas that we can press into and a lot of different models that we can experiment with. And this has been really valuable for us. Uh, and I, I think it's part of the reason that we're gaining such traction, whether it's conversations directly with employers, um, expanding uh, populations with uh, payers, and I think even engaging uh, the provider network and the provider community. Go ahead. So tackling kind of the questions and um, gosh, I thought about this one a lot. Um, so I think we've touched on this that, you know, the, the significant market influencers uh, really can help. Um, I think we want to go back one. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> Sorry about that. My computer is no worries. One more. There we are. Okay. Um, so I think, you know, inertia is a really strong force, right? And I think the, the, the folks that can influence the market the best are often the ones that have the, the largest uh, footprint and probably are within a model that has been beneficial to them. So it, it really has to be kind of this, and I know that Don talked about this kind of moral imperative of change of care. I think that's part of it. I think the other piece, and it'll go to my first uh, obstacle there, but um, I love this quote by Minkin. Um, I've heard it a couple of different settings, uh, and I think it's it's really key to how we approach problems. I think very quickly we can move into if we just do this, or if this is the linchpin, and it's not. It's it's so multifactorial that it really requires that I think that moral imperative under undergirding it all. So for us, complexity is the first major ob obstacle. Um, you know, I think there's two pieces here that I would call out. One, uh, you know, I've, I've worked in the healthcare finance background for a long time, and it is just really stinking complex. Um, everything from how many corrected fields you need to have on a claim to how you describe the services that are provided to, you know, from a business case standpoint, which I think is the focus of the conversation right now, you know, there are a lot of different organizations that are in that value stream. Uh, I think Sue Birch uh, earlier today talked about profiteering. You know, it is a little bit of an arms race uh, from an analytics standpoint, from a digital resource standpoint, from, uh, you know, a pretty facility standpoint, all of these things factor into uh, where those dollars are. And we feel like very often a bigger and bigger chunk of the dollars should be apportioned towards primary care and really wellness on the front end are getting distributed elsewhere. I think the second thing, and again, I don't want to be redundant to some of my colleagues, but Consumers have limited engagement. Um, first off, it's it's complicated, right? It's a world where how do you find the right provider? How do you make decisions? Everybody's got the banner uh, that says they're number one. Um, you know, I was watching football with my son recently, and there was a, a car commercial, and it had something about you know a JD Power and Associate review of the car, and and he said, you know, I think every single commercial says that about every single car. Um, yeah, I think that's true, and so we see some of that. And there's a lot of really great care being provided. So, you know, there, there's some linkage to it, but consumers don't, I think they get overwhelmed from that. And then I think finally, you know, when you have uh, scenarios where um, a consumer pays a, a little bit on the front end uh, and then essentially their responsibility from a financial standpoint goes away. Now, that's a really hard problem to solve. I don't have a solution around that. And obviously we wouldn't want to expose consumers to unbound risk, but I think it does impact their, their engagement. And then with employers, and we're talking with a lot of employers right now and, and working to build uh, arrangements that will meet their tailored needs. But there's a lot of fear in this space too. Um, you know, they don't wanna, they wanna be a, a location that draws employees and retains employees. And so if we think about what those things will be effective, it's not always just more benefits and more dollars. We have to tailor that experience. But then on the other side, they're hesitant to say, I don't want to create complexity. I don't want to be, you know, a lower um, value employer from a benefit standpoint in the marketplace. So I, I think that's a big deal. And then I think, you know, depending on the size of the organization, I think a lot of the big organizations will have an opportunity to have large resources that could put together a vision and a plan about what they want as an employer. But that's not true for, you know, you go below some certain threshold and, and the person who's managing the benefit plan may not spend much time on it and may not understand all of the nuances. So we have to fill that gap. 
go ahead to the last slide if you would. So what are the things we can do and what are the things we're asking for? So from an EHN standpoint, you know, Eastside Health Network really, again, provider led, we're prioritizing in part the wellness of our providers. And it's, it's multifactorial, right? We wanna make sure obviously the last bullet point on that spec that they are rewarded for the things that um, they're doing. And we begin to learn how to incentivize for the indirect care in a way um, that we're not doing now. But I think also we've spent a lot of time on provider wellness groups, social support and reducing burnout. This is a really important um, initiative for us because we believe again, that if, if we take good care of our providers, our patients will benefit from that. Uh, you know, Lloyd touched on the, just the massive shift we've seen um, with data aggregation, the ability to see all things digitally or almost all things digitally. And I think our burden for our providers is how do we make that into a digestible single view uh, of information. Uh, behavioral health continues to play a really prominent role and is a larger and larger focus for us at EHN almost daily in the work that we're pursuing. Uh, workflow improvements, I think are self-explanatory, but you know, how do we remove uh, the work that uh, is non-value added really? When we look externally, again, these will sound repetitive from uh, things that are highlighted uh, earlier in the, the presentations, but I think, you know, we chase so many different metrics um, and, and so many of them, the conversations revolved around, do we chase the metrics because we believe these are efficacious in making patients healthier or is it because they're easy to track and easy to capture? And I think, unfortunately, it's the latter more often than it's the former. So we're really looking at saying, you know, can we get to a core measure set that does represent and have some uh, proxy for the work that we're doing? And yet, how do we um, start to iterate and move forward in that? The second one really is then the infrastructure investment. And so we really see this on primary care again. And I know this is a common theme over and over, but um, this is critical to us. When we look for relationships to build with payers and employers, and providers, you know, the payer employer conversation is around how do we make sure that we get um, investment into the infrastructure of the providers. And when we talk with the providers, the follow-up question is how do we help them um, use that money effectively? And how do we help to simplify the process really uh, as part of an adjunct to the, the first part of the slide? So that's in a nutshell, my thoughts. <laughs> so thank, thank you so you much. So much. I think the key word of the day is alignment. And um, Rebecca, we're gonna turn to you to bring us home and then we'll get to have a, a great conversation. So interested to hear what the levers of change are that you're activating at Landmark Health as a new business model and what you're looking for from, from our partners. Great, welcome. Uh, I'm glad to be here today to listen to these ideas and perspectives. My name is Rebecca Cavusi. I'm the president uh, for the West region of Landmark, um, which includes Washington, Oregon, California, and hopefully, many other states uh, in the Western side of the country soon. I have spent most of my career working in policy strategy operations and fortunately always with integrated health plans and delivery systems, including community health plan, group health and Geisinger prior to Landmark. So um, as a new entrant, I do wanna spend a few minutes orienting you to what Landmark does because unlike some of my esteemed uh, colleagues on the panel, you may not all be familiar with us although we appreciate the call out from David Mielstein earlier. Uh, I wouldn't be at this organization if I didn't think we had a tremendous opportunity to dramatically improve our health system and solve some of those key cost issues that would allow us to invest those dollars better elsewhere, as Dr. Berwick mentioned earlier. So Landmark is a national organization. We have medical groups in 16 states and currently cover 120,000 lives under risk arrangements. In the Pacific Northwest, this includes uh, a medical group that covers King, Pierce, Nahomish, Clark, Spokane counties, plus Portland. Uh, we are a 24 seven mobile provider group. So we deliver all of our services where patients reside. So typically in homes, but also could be in assisted living facilities, sometimes at homeless shelters. And uh, this year so far, we've done 300,000 longitudinal visits, uh, 75,000 urgent visits and because of COVID, it sped this up uh, quite a few televideo visits as well. Our patients are selected uh, as the top five to 10% most sick patients in any health plan IPA or at-risk provider groups population. So most of our patients are Medicare Advantage, uh, but we also serve dual Medicaid and commercial patients. Uh, they're typically very uh, frail and elderly, but uh, as you'll see in the next slide, uh, chronic conditions play a key point. Uh, role in how we select our patients. 
So Landmark exists to change the trajectory of outcomes and utilization for a very small uh, but very expensive population to keep them out of the hospital, reduce bed days when they are admitted, and uh, to understand and help our patients die the way they want to. Because as we all know, end of life costs are a significant driver of costs in our system and we're not getting uh, for those dollars what patients want. Uh, and our goal is transformative results for the small slice of the population in order to free up resources for better purposes. So this population that we serve is the, the population driving 40 to 60% of all healthcare spending. And for that spending, they are not getting the right outcomes and they are not dying the way they would like to. Uh, all of our providers are employed. They're all surrounded by an interdisciplinary team of social workers, behavioral health providers, nurse care managers, pharmacists, et cetera. And they don't act as a PCP, but rather augment and coordinate with PCPs and other specialists. Um, and our model, I'm proud uh, to report, has replicated similar results all across the country. Uh, including a 20 to 30% reduction in total cost of care on the entire group of eligible patients, even though we typically max out engagement at about 65%. So we're touching about 65% of the population and able to reduce total cost of care by 20 to 30%, uh, as well as achieve four and five star quality on this really complex group of patients. You can go to the next slide. You're already there. Okay. Uh, so what is our unique perspective? As David Milstein mentioned earlier, as a newer entrant, we are fortunate. We are unencumbered by a lot of the fixed costs, which are legacy operations. And we were really able six years ago to start building something tailor-made to focus on a, uh, the problem of the five to 10% of people who have been confounding today's health system by spending a lot and not getting good outcomes. So uh, five main elements I think that are, that are key to the perspective we bring in what we tried to build. First is selecting the right patients. So uh, our patients are chosen based on the number of chronic conditions, uh, not based on cost. And this is to avoid regression to the mean. David mentioned earlier, some of the patients who are driving costs are there for one year, but they uh, then disappear and that's not, they don't have those costs in the future. Our patients with 8.6 on average chronic conditions um, are really uh, about to hit a, a very predictable trajectory where their costs go up and up and up. They experience a lot of hospitalization, skilled nursing facility days, and then um, very expensive end of life care. So uh, focusing on this population means we don't have to be good at everything. We need to be very good at seeing this population and building the things that they need. Um, and our, uh, to Dr. Berwick's point, one of the things I'm really proud of, and we have been talking a lot about, is that this selection algorithm based on number of chronic conditions means we are finding the most vulnerable people in the communities we serve. Uh, and that means we are serving a lot of people of color, a lot of people who the health system um, has not served in the past. And the model is addressing some of the social determinants of health. Now, of course, they came with a lot of those already baked uh, in terms of starting from childhood, as we heard, but we are bringing care to people to break down access to care. We are building a team specifically designed to mitigate some of the social determinants like food insecurity, behavioral health, um, and cultural competency around palliative and end of life conversations, which is really key. The second uh, key area that I think is uh, very important to what we do is, and we all know it, data is very critical to managing risk. Uh, for us, that combination of claims data that we get from our, our partners and the data that we have in our EMR allows us to identify which patients to focus on at a given point in time. And that is fluid. We all know that. Um, so we've invested a lot in the technology to leverage this data to know who to focus on when. Our providers have access to a lot of what they need on their iPhone. So two examples. We have a scheduling system that routes providers from their home in the morning throughout their day and back home to squeeze out as much drive time inefficiency as possible. Because as you can imagine, compared to a clinic system, uh, that drive time is a, a critical potential for inefficiency for us. We are about to launch an app for our providers and our IDT team that'll allow them to push a button if they have a cancellation while out in the field and it'll pop up for them the highest priority patients they could see within a two mile, five mile radius to use that time that they have uh, effectively before their next visit. Third, the model of care. So obviously we have very uh, been fortunate to replace the brick and mortar costs 
with a very intensive care team that's suited to the high needs of our target population. Uh, the goal for us, we talk a lot about consumers having skin in the game. For this particular population, the name of the game for us is to reduce barriers to care because our patients have, they see barriers everywhere. Time with their PCP and their specialist to get through all their issues, to have an end of life conversation that's meaningful, cost. Uh, which have been crushing given their health systems. Mobility, their ability just to leave their home is an issue for a lot of our patients. Um, so they have a lot of these social determinants as well on top of these medical problems. So our goal is to really eliminate those barriers uh, for this group of patients. Fifth, uh, we want to, we complement office-based care. We don't want to replicate parts of the system that are working, uh, providing great primary care to uh, large patient populations. What we wanna do is work with a small segment of patients and we recognize we don't need to do it all for them to really be able to make the difference, but we do need to give them more access than they've been able to have in the traditional system. Um, and I, I will point out, we have trademarked the term complexivist and I, I often think we have, uh, we have hospitalists, we have all sorts of specialists who have really uh, come about to specialize in certain things. And I, I hope and expect that in the future, uh, every health plan and at-risk provider group will have a set of complexivists that they work with who really do what we do and do it well. And then last, talked about this a lot, uh, we get paid on value, not on volume. So uh, it allows us to, to design our workflows and incentives around the outcomes and to take advantage of the laboratories we have around the country to continually find more efficient ways to get to the desired endpoint for free of constraints of um, can it be paid for by a CPT code? As, as Lloyd mentioned, you know, there's some of those things that make it hard when you have to really think about if we do this and it's the right thing, can we get paid for it? Um, so I don't have another slide, but I'm gonna answer the questions that my colleagues answered as well. So first, uh, what are the top two obstacles to change from um, my perspective? I'd say first, it's been talked about a lot, payment. Uh, I have worked in organizations and seen it and it really, um, uh, it is, the payment structure has challenged provider groups to take one step off the dock of fee-for-service and get into that boat of value-based care and be able to make that balance. And so I think that's, that's key. Um, how can we do that better? Um, the second to me is interoperability. David LaMarche mentioned um, the arms race for every system to be developing everything and then the difficulty of getting those things to talk together. So it sometimes makes collaboration really hard uh, when, you know, I certainly know everything we do and how we drive our model is driven through our EMR. Well, how can our EMR talk to everybody else's EMR because they're trying to do the same thing? Excuse me. Uh, second, what's the number one priority for change that's within landmark sphere of control? Um, I'll do a gimme, which is I think for us, we just want to keep doing what we're doing and doing it bigger to demonstrate that this is really one way to solve this very uh, confounding problem. But the harder thing probably for us is we need to work, continue to work on integration to make what we do seamless with our partners uh, across the health system. And then finally, two top priorities for change that we would ask of others. Um, I'll say for providers, um, be willing to partner and recognize that not one organ, no one organization is good at everything. Um, I know from working within provider organizations that uh, even those doing amazing things have a very hard time dedicating the focus to build the muscle necessary to serve this part of the population when they maybe only make up, you know, five to 10% of your patients. Um, and if organizations who want to step into risk can partner with organizations who really know how to manage those high dollar patients and do it well, it can make that easier. And then finally, I'd say to purchasers, it was really great to see what the healthcare authority is working on. And, and as we're working towards value to sort of arrest those trends that David uh, Muelstein shared, we have to aspire to actually slow the increase of spending, not just stabilize it and to drive down the trajectory. And we know it's possible given all the waste. Um, so I think it would be very interesting to see the healthcare authority, to see the federal government set targets for with the dollars saved, how they, what they would reinvest in those things and employers as well in terms of wages, early childhood supports, education. So can we tie value-based payment goals to reinvestment goals? That's it. Rebecca, thank you so much. And I'm gonna ask the other panelists and David Muelstein to join us on camera. 
and we're going to jump into some of the questions. And I can say right now at 11.08, when we are scheduled to leave at 11.30, and we're going to leave a little bit of time for a closing from Dr. Hugh Straley and Nancy Ginto, the Executive Director of the Washington Health Alliance, we will not have time to get to all of your fantastic questions. Um, we are tracking those. We are saving those. Expect to see some blogs. Expect to see some emails. There will be, we will do our best to sort of um, close the loop on as many of those as we can. And, and the reality of all of us is we're all connected here in Washington State, and we'll continue to have these conversations, and these questions will inform those as well. So, so going from the beginning of this, where we had the really big, you know, moral challenge around addressing social determinants of health, and that's outside the healthcare system to what can we do within the healthcare system? And the important sort of point that Don Berwick made from his email is it's an and equation, not an or equation. Um, one of the, we've gotten questions from interoperability. We've got questions around pricing inequities. We've got questions around aligned payment measures. And we've heard about all of these from all of you. I wanna start with um, primary care. Um, because it seems to be sort of a central point and a foundational element of value-based care. And we've got some questions about the important role of primary care and how do we promote better use and access of it. We heard Lloyd talk about how to scale it better to meet the needs of the patients. And I think really importantly, um, we also heard from David LaMarche and Lloyd this idea that the payers are not just health plans, they are also large purchasers who are self-funded and making their own key decisions. So having said all of that, I'm gonna ask um, David, uh, David Mulstein to share any perspectives he has from a national view of this, but locally, what, is, what has been holding us back in terms of um, making those moves that we need to make around primary care and knowing that the authority is working so hard to push this now, what can we do differently today? So I'm interested to hear what will happen locally. Um, I think one of the things that I've observed is that this is very much a local um, transition and what works really well in Washington state won't work at all in Florida where I live. And so understanding the local dynamics of those providers, I think um, one of the things that I would just encourage that we continue to focus on is preparing the next generation of physicians because it's, there's always a challenge with getting people that have been playing basketball for their whole life to switch to playing soccer in their mid 40s. And that's kind of what happens in the typical primary care world moving to the value-based world is asking people to change their, their sport. And so it's getting people trained from the get-go so they know that the sport is value-based care, proactive management of populations and being incentivized to keep people from going into the hospital. And if you start that at the outset, you're gonna have a lot more better outcomes than if you try to do it um, halfway through their career. Thanks, David. Locally, thoughts on that? The primary care? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a swing at it. Um, so I think the other piece is, you know, to stick with David's analogy is you gotta give them the right ball too, right? Um, yeah, I've kicked a uh, basketball and it's not nearly as pleasant as a soccer ball. Uh, so I think, you know, this model shift also requires us to think about how we provide actionable, timely data. Um, you know, if we're asking providers to close care gaps, if we're trying to share information with them, it can't be something that's 120 days old. Um, and it, it, uh, I think we run into these challenges continually where they're just overwhelmed. So how do we create uh, an experience for them that is uh, aggregated, uh, kind of a single source, timely and actionable. And I think that's a huge, that's a huge um, piece because they, they really want to do the right thing and they really want to see this progress. And very often I think it's more of a, I'm going to treat the person in front of me. I have to manage my indirect work. And, and I think very often they're, they're not connected. So if I could add, Karen, I, I'd say what, and my, you guys, my camera, my camera is frozen by you guys, but, um, but what's added, urgency to this is um, primary care has became, became an unsustainable profession with all the demands that are placed on them. And so you know, we've been desperate to augment the care team. And one of the challenges we face, this community has a shortage of medical assistants and a shortage of uh, medical social workers. So we have a care team model that frankly, uh, we can't always fully stand. But it's the desperation of primary care docs that we wanted, as David said, want to do it all, but can't, uh, that really fuels the fire. So, Frankly, we don't feel you know, held back in terms of not wanting to do it. Uh, we feel sort of an urgency factor around it. Karen or Rebecca, did you want to weigh in? 
I would say in our model, it is fundamentally about putting the economics there up front. It is an investment and there are trade-offs in terms of work-life balance. It's not a production shop. It's one that's got to lead to quality. So it's put it put the investment there up front, get the gains on the back end in terms of aiming at um, improvement in the total cost of care and, and aligning incentives towards that. We do that absolutely in our model. We're also doing it in, in some, some limited number of contract relationships. The only thing I'll add is I, I mean, agree that the investment in primary care is key. One of the things we look at is we expect and do see that when Landmark gets involved with our, our group of patients, typically their primary care visits go up and their hospital and specialty visits go down. There's a lot of specialty overutilization with a chronic comorbid group of patients. So, um, you know, getting more of those primary care uh, visits and management is key. Yeah, I think Rebecca, you also mentioned interoperability and the importance of that. And I think one of the disconnects that we see between the purchaser world, which is uh, supportive of broad PPO networks where I can go wherever I want to. And I'm just speaking to the commercial population right now. There's certainly other considerations for Medicare and Medicaid, but I can go wherever I want. But my providers don't always communicate with each other. Even though I can choose any one of them, they have chosen who to share information with about me in a very seamless time um, time sensitive way. And David, I think that speaks to the comments you were making. Are you seeing an urgency around interoperability and the movement toward that as well? Uh, I did. Um, I would say that this year has redirected a lot of interest. Um, but yes, uh, in, before COVID, I think that was a, it was a major focus. I think I heard Sue Birch mention this as well. David Lamarche, um, I, any thoughts that you have on that? Yeah, I, I mean, it's almost uh, treating the symptom. Right, so we're trying to force interoperability to compensate for the fact that we don't ask members to engage with PCP. Right, I think uh, it was actually Dan Lessler at the Healthcare Authority several years ago, the first time I heard the term free range PPO um, mm -hmm. with the implication of people can go wherever they want. And that becomes a really important um, carrot, I think, for some employers to offer their employees in a heavy, uh, heavily competitive talent uh, environment. Right, you don't you want to put out the, the widest choice possible, but you know, our interoperability components, sometimes we're trying to solve the problem to, to say, well, because you go anywhere you want, we have to try to, you know, figure out how to connect these things instead of creating a little bit better cohesion for, um, for care. And if we're going to take responsibility as a, you know, as a clinically integrated network for cost, quality, and patient experience, I have to be able to see the patient. Um, so that becomes a kind of a juxtaposition. So I think we have time for one last question. And here's a really good question that came in that I think gets us from the opening around social determinants of health to the delivery system role in this. And it says, how do you address disparities um, as noted earlier in terms of social determinants of health as a way of also combating the healthcare spend as a percentage of GDP? I'm thinking in terms of a reallocation of some of the spend on healthcare to spending on addressing disparities. Seems very logical, but whose job is that? I can tell you whose job it is to block that. And that's gonna be anybody that would be foregoing money. And that's the challenge that we have is that whenever we talk about redistributing sand within the sandbox, somebody has a lot of sand in their corner and they're going to fight tooth and nail to prevent it from going to another corner. And I think that's the barrier that we have as a country is that we have created a system that incentivizes high cost, high utilization corners. Um, and there's just not an incentive to pull things away. And heaven forbid we try to take sand out of the sandbox completely, um, that's when everybody is up in arms. But I think that's the barrier is that those that have the money are gonna be reluctant to give it up. So, you know, David, I really liked your framing around, you know, we're not gonna get there in two years, right? This is gonna be a multi-year journey. And I think that's absolutely true here. And we've gotta start learning from what's working. I'll speak to one case study. I came out of the Oregon market before I came into Washington and they, they did a big, big Medicaid expansion and they had their ACOs for Medicaid. One of the things they tied to it was they implemented screening for food insecurity across physician practices. This was a very powerful tool. It was a simple thing, but very powerful in terms of identifying where there were issues and then tying it into social services it was part of a formula where there was more money actually put into Medicaid. 
And, you know, and I think there are some very strong learnings emerging from things like that. So I think a lot of steps in that direction, backed by commitment of organizations and boards driving these outcomes will, you know, we're going to hit a tipping point at some point if we, if we start moving these tests of change. So I would just add to that though, you know, um, it's not in our wheelhouse. I mean, it's like solving food insecurity is not a core competency for healthcare organizations, right? Identifying it is or should be. And, and we are starting to establish partnerships with community-based organizations that can be part of that solution. And I definitely think we're gonna to have to build those kinds of bridges and links if we wanna tackle that issue. And I, I would say too, that I think for the first time we're seeing payers start to incentivize and reward some of the social determinants of health. And, and even in a kind of progressive model where initially track, pick your two, three, four things to track, food insecurity, whatever it might be. And then what's your plan beyond that to say, okay, primary care is your vehicle to, I think, Karen, get back to the, the question of, of addressing the social determinants of health, right? I think the Healthcare authority this morning highlighted family-based care, right? That that it's not, um, you know, that it's holistic, and I think that's part of that that conversation. But, you know, starting to see incentivization of the activity of understanding, building it into your workflows, and then, you know, hopefully parallel, we'll be solving the problems of, okay, the answer is yes. Now what? Yeah. Any other final final thoughts for the good of the order? Well, I'll just repeat what my last challenge was, which is I think it's having watched the healthcare authority for the last 15 or 20 years to see it is like moving a, a giant ship. It takes a while. It takes iterations and, you know, moving slowly, but to the extent we're moving and saying, okay, you know, by this year, we want X number of contracts to be value-based. Shouldn't we also be setting targets for what we want to see for savings and withholds from that, and then setting targets for how we think as a state or as a federal government, these very large purchases, or as a commercial uh, employer, how we would wanna reinvest those funds to motivate some of that change. So I think with that, we probably have to turn it over for our closing. David Muelstein, thank you for joining us from the East Coast. David Lamar, Lloyd David, Rebecca Cavusi, Karen Sharman, thank you for being with us today. You didn't know it, I don't think, when we teed this up, that you would be part of creating a framework for action. But this whole summit today is really about a call to action and really getting real about the things that we all have to do differently and how we have to ask each other to step up differently as well. And with that, I turn it over over to Executive Director of the Washington Health Alliance, Nancy Ginto, and Dr. Yu Straley for some closing comments. And thank you all very, very much. And thank you all in the audience for your questions. They were fantastic. I want to add my thanks as well. And wow, what a series of conversations today. We could go on, I know, for a much longer period of time. I think we've heard great insights today, as well as a lot of practical advice about how to advance these concepts of value-based purchasing and moral determinants of health from um, several experts. You know, unfortunately, I think chances are pretty great that the fire and passion we feel about these topics right at this moment, as we've been in the moment uh, together this morning and the actions we commit to make today and post-summit will dissipate if we return to the hundreds of tasks before us both today, tomorrow, and next week. That is unless we personalize our commitments to value and to changing the general unaffordability of healthcare. Because I really believe without making these issues personal, and I mean really personal, nothing is going to happen. So I'm gonna go at a little risk with you here today and I'm gonna make this very personal and tell you about my mom, Dorothy, and how seeking value-based care is front and center in our lives today. Dorothy's 91 years old. She lives independently in a senior community for 55 plus aged adults near Dallas, Texas. She's very lucky that genes are on her side. Her mom lived to 104, her grandmother lived to 86. I can only hope that the strong maternal genes for longevity have been passed my way. She's very lucky in that she enjoys a strong community support network that unfortunately has been impacted greatly by the pandemic. She's healthy, she has a very light medication regimen for someone of her age, 
and she is really sharp mentally. She's as sharp as I remember her at 65 years of age, including managing all of her finances independently with just a little help. Dorothy's health challenges her mobility. She's having problems with osteoarthritic uh, arthritis in both knees. She describes her pain as getting progressively worse and she's begun to fall. She's experienced three falls in the last four months. In her quest to address her knee pain, Dorothy started with non-surgical support based on my coaching, as you can imagine, and the self-education she did using evidence-based decision tools. She visited pain management experts and acupuncturists to no avail, and she also tried less clinically sound approaches. And unfortunately, pain relief was very short-lived. She's now adamant that she wants knee surgery. Remember, this is at the age of 91 years old. And the conclusion from her visit to orthopedic surgeon number one was that both of these knees should be operated on at once. Now you can guess my response to that idea. I told her, mom, I wouldn't have double knee surgery and I don't advise it for anyone, especially someone living independently like you are. Now, orthopedic surgeon number two suggested a more conservative approach, approaching one knee at a time, considering one knee at a time. And to this point, neither of these surgeons are willing to answer some really basic questions about quality and outcome metrics that I helped my mom formulate. Inquiries like, how many cases have you performed on patients 90 years of age and over? What are their outcomes? How are they doing in terms of returning to activities of daily living? And by what time? What's your surgical infection rate for all patients? And what is it for those who are 90 years and older? What are the financial obligations beyond what Medicare covers? And what prosthetic device do you use and why? Do you have a financial arrangement with the manufacturer in terms of trips, speaking engagements and the like with the prosthetic that you choose? Answers to these questions are measurable, they're knowable. And as consumers and patient advocates, we must start acting, asking them. And I can assure you that my mom, before she has surgery, will get answers to these questions. And I would say that all of us need to have the courage and become better educated on how to engage providers in these types of conversations. And working for, with doctors for most of my career, I can tell you that the best of them will be very happy to engage in these conversations. So here's the value conundrum I'm facing with my siblings. Realizing that our mom is in the final chapter of her life, do we encourage knee surgery that may or may not improve mobility and carries increased risk at her age? The stakes are high. The quality of her life may be greatly increased or monumentally worsened. And we clearly understand that the ultimate treatment choice is hers to make, and we're doing all we can to support her decision. So I'm grappling with the answer to this dilemma now, and you bet it's personal, because I'm the kid that knows healthcare best, and I'm the one looked to for advice. So my encouragement to all of you to make the issue of value-based care and healthcare affordability personal, make it personal for yourself. Each participant on today's call has responsible for contributing to healthcare on affordability in our country. We all do this by the decisions we make and or how we run our businesses every day. And that means we have the power to influence how care is delivered and purchased in big and small ways, and we have to take up the mantle to do so. Let your personal story be your catalyst to action and the idea that motivates you over the long term to help fix the problem that we've all created and that we all perpetuate every day. And then commit with me to join arms with all stakeholders on the call today. Let's collectively resolve to propel the trajectory of value-based care and purchasing in our state forward as rapidly as possible. And let me just end by saying that we owe this to all Washingtonians and especially to the patients and their advocates in our state who are not as adept at navigating this complex and confusing world of decision-making in healthcare that we've all created and keep going. Let's take the challenge of tackling the moral determinants of health as Don Burwick coached us, and let's move resources to the areas of greatest need. 
And to my colleagues at the Bree Collaborative, I say thank you to you for your outstanding and longstanding partnership, and also to Cambia Grow for your sponsorship of today's event. Thanks everyone for being a part. Thank you, um, Nancy. Um, again, I'm Hugh Straley, and uh, my job is to wrap up. We started the day with a call to action, and I'm going to finish the day with a call to action. But after uh, everything from Don Berwick to uh, David Milstein to the Healthcare Authority and our panelists, uh, who knew that healthcare was so complex? Um, our call to action is really to ask for alignment and uh, collaboration. But let me just uh, uh, sort of mention Don's call to action. You know, I was overwhelmed by his uh, statement that we need to uh, uh, consider uh, healthcare as a human right, and we need to deal with climate change, and we need to deal with the criminal justice system and the immigration policy and hunger and homelessness and poverty. And I think this is what we are, are facing as a nation and as a, a, a world. But as citizens, we must insist that we address these issues. And as healthcare providers, we know that until these are addressed, that we will never have the more perfect uh, healthcare system. But Don also had mentioned that, and we must continue to work uh, so that healthcare is safe, timely, effective, efficient, equitable, and patient-centered. And those remain the, the goals for uh, the triple aim. Um, the, uh, uh, David talked about how uh, uh, costs are rising and the imperative to deal with costs um, and that medical inflation, if unless we can deal with that, we will be, uh, uh, Medic Medicare will be uh, uh, bankrupt in four years. Uh, so cost containment and cost reduction, as everyone has said, is most, most important. Um, the healthcare authority is moving on the roadmap to uh, value-based payment and is showing several different models for care, uh, which I think are important. The panel uh, actually represented to me in the, in the uh, multiple delivery systems that consolidation in delivery is happening among all providers, uh, both hospitals and uh, clinics uniting uh, to look at different payment models, look at different metric systems and uh, look at different in interventions. But uh, common themes that we uh, did here today, uh, and this is the call to action, asking for alignment and collaboration. Uh, we heard a clear and convincing call for payers, including self-funded purchasers, to support aligned multi-payer value-based payment models that eliminate uh, administrative complexity. And we heard that aligning performance measurement across payers, including self-funded purchasers, will allow providers to focus on making the needed improvements in care delivery and not in managing contractual arrangements. Uh, we've heard that collaboration among partnership uh, for partners is really important. Alignment across uh, the four uh, uh, stakeholders, providers, uh, payers, uh, patients and uh, plans. We heard that benefit designs that encourage members to seek care from providers that commit to value-based payment models is needed. And clearly an investment in primary care and uh, behavioral health uh, integration is an important element in everything that we're doing. And clearly there are many levers for change that are within your reach. In keeping with our theme of the day, we have one last call to action before we close. The Washington Health Alliance and the Bree Collaborative will be coming to you after today's summit to ask you to take the pledge uh, to accelerate the value-based adoption uh, in Washington State. To take the pledge, we simply ask that you commit to taking steps you are not taking today or furthering the work that you have already started. And we've seen some of that work starting uh, in the healthcare authority, as well as in uh, the uh, organizations that were on our panel. If we all pledge to take action, there's nothing holding us back from making health and healthcare in Washington state a model for the country. At the same time, we have to address not only the social determinants of health, but the moral determinants of health that Dr. Berwick so eloquently uh, described. So our work is ahead of us 
and uh, let us move forward. You will be hearing from us uh, uh, in uh, the next several days to take the pledge. I wanna thank everybody for their participation, for hanging in there for the entire morning. And I turn it back uh, to, uh, uh, is it to Karen or Amy? I think it, I think you are our close, Dr. Strang. I am closing then. So <laughs> thank you all for your participation. You will be hearing from us shortly. Uh, take the pledge. <laughs>